and welcome to uh, episode five, episode five of Tomorrow's World Audit Time. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Russ. They said it would never happen. I know. Very few podcasts reach episode five, I believe. <laughs> I believe the wastage rate is huge. So this is a, this is a, this Ooh. is an enormous, enormous milestone in our podcasting career. <laughs> Um, and I, yeah, yeah, I think we've got something a little bit special just to celebrate it as well. We do. It's a very special episode for a very special anniversary. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, oh, imagine what we'll be able to do when we reach episode ten. Oh, the mind boggles. Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine. <laughs> I mean, there's only thirteen hundred and ninety-five episodes left to pick from, Russ. So <laughs> choose wisely. Um, yes. Well, I, I mean, this one it comes from the third uh, of June, nineteen seventy-six. And um, mm. during the 1970s, particularly, Tomorrow's World quite often would have special episodes uh, where they, where the whole episode was sort of around one theme. And quite often they'd, they'd go off abroad and go and look, look at something. Uh, this one comes from the um, Habitat 76 conference, which is a uh, UN conference, uh, also known as Habitat 1, confusingly. But it was the first UN confident conference on human settlements. So basically everything in this episode is uh, about housing and and mm. how people live and things like that. It's quite a it's quite a funky episode. A lot of bell bottom flares. Mm-hmm. Very much, yeah, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. It's actually quite entertaining. I know it doesn't doesn't sound like it would be very entertaining. I was a bit. I have to say, when you sent it to me, I was a bit concerned <laughs> to, to begin with. <laughs> but it's um, yeah, it shines through. It's really good, and it is incredibly seventies in, in a rather wonderful way. I think visually, anyway, at least. But I mean, <laughs> well, to be fair, the mu- the music's great. I thought, I thought, you know, you you like houses and stuff. You like a bit of architecture. I do. You, I work, do, you true. work for the council. There's loads of uh, you know, there's loads of council and architecture stuff in this. I mean, as I, I, mean, as I said to you, it's either this or uh, a European weapon special with Judith Hand driving a chieftain tank. But um, but yeah, I, th- I didn't think that would you'd enjoy that as much. Well, I mean that that, that says fifteenth um, episode anniversary <laughs> if ever I heard it, Russ. No, no, you're right. And actually, what was interesting was uh, I mean, even today I had meetings about housing, and there is some of these issues have remained not as kind of you know we're still dealing with the same problems, but but the concerns and and the approach to to improving you know the way people live and how they live. Yeah, there's, there's a lot from this episode that kind of feels like it's the starting point of of a different approach to housing, which sounds like it's going to be hilarious for us. <laughs> um, so start sewing those sides back together again because they're going to tear open. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, Mark. There is, as always, there's been one huge surprise for me while doing my research. Uh, and, mm-hmm. oh. and I think <laughs> it comes from the most unexpected place. And I think, I think... You and the people at home will really appreciate it, uh, but that's, yeah, but that's 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 for later, Mark. That's for later. Oh, you're a prof- you're a professional team. I'm excited <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Um, okay, well, I, I'll be tuning in to listen to find out. So, yeah. three, two, one. Let's cue Raymond, shall we? This week, the United Nations Conference Habitat has opened in Vancouver. Its theme, Places for People. Now, the idea grew from a previous get-together in Stockholm in 1972. That was called Only One Earth. Its scope was huge, the detrimental effect that man is having on his environment. They tried to discuss citizen settlements, but found it was too complex and too vital a subject to form just one part of a conference. So, since Monday, statesmen, including Mr. Peter Shaw and a British government delegation of 30, planners, enthusiasts and cynics from all over the world have been pouring into Vancouver. William Willard was there. So, Raymond's uh, Raymond's out on the playground. Our old friend Raymond, yeah. yeah. He starts off uh, reclining on a uh, geodesic climbing frame. Um, Yes, he does. Uh, and he's, he shares the screen with a uh, man who comes out of a building scratching his ass. Uh, yes, he does. <laughs> Very finely dressed man. I like the suit and the uh, the, the burgundy uh, V-neck jumper he's wearing. But it's not what we're looking at. It's where that hand goes. <laughs> at least, he doesn't sniff it, though, at least. Well, we don't know that. He walks off. <laughs> he walks off. 
he's, he's a busy man, Russ. <laughs> he's got things to do. Um, yeah, and also a uh, soft drinks can, possibly a Seven Up or Sprite, is front and centre uh, in the yeah. street, and I, all I, it's all I can stare at. It, it keeps distracting me from from Raymond <laughs> and his big, yeah, big bronze tie. Yeah. yeah, I think R- Raymond's. Well, I think well, the previous time we saw Raymond, he was in black and white, wasn't he? So um, yes, he was. Yeah, he, he does. He does seem quite. Oh, this is eleven years later, isn't it? So he does seem a little bit, a um, little bit older. He seems, he seems yeah. more than 11 years older, I think, but that might be because the black and white was more flattering to him. Well, I mean, my issue with uh, the episode from 65 was that I just, I could, you couldn't work out how old he was. No. He had that kind of, back then, people were just, they were either young or old, and uh, the, the boundary between them, I suppose, was dependent on, I don't know, when you went through, I think when you got your D-mob suit, I don't know what it was, but, you know, it was, but once you went through that boundary, you know, that's it, you, you looked over ever. So he he looks, you know, he looks more grandfatherly than he did last time. Yeah. Nice, nice double-breasted suit, though. Smart, you know. Mm. Mm. He knows what he's doing. He's professional. Um, We should also say that, uh, as this is a special episode, we do have special opening titles. Same classic tune. Yep. Which I know has been going through our heads Week. Yes, yeah, it goes, uh, but we do... it goes through my head every time Tomorrow's World is ever mentioned now. It's, 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 it's insane. <laughs> Which is more than most people <laughs> yeah. have the word Tomorrow's World mentioned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so special uh, UN Habitat Vancouver-based titles. It's, uh, to my mind, Ross, it looks like they filmed this in the back of a car because they forgot to film <laughs> footage for opening titles. It has that kind of feel to it. <laughs> yeah. It starts off, so we... On the way back to the airport, do you think? <laughs> just, just, yeah, on the way back to the airport. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's like, quick, bollocks, quick. <laughs> so, uh, Tomorrow's World uh, spelled out in glitter in a lovely 70s typeface. I'm assuming these are from the main uh, titles, which must have been around mm. this time, because obviously it's gone colour, so they would have they would have uh, updated their titles. Uh, we see a, a kind of... <laughs> all these images, I'm sure, would have been incredibly glamorous at the time. Any kind of footage, I suppose, from North America would have been incredibly glamorous. But now it looks really muddy and beige and kind of dirty. But uh, we see a Vancouver city centre exit one mile road sign yep. uh, on a verge. And it was, it was at this um, point see... that I thought, hang on a minute, this is the opening title to The Sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has that kind of feel to it, but it's not all, quite all as... Need, um... All I need is Raymond in the car smoking a big cigar, like cut, cut to... Yeah, yeah. And... I'm, at, I'm at the yeah. window. Traffic on a bridge... Nothing terribly sophisticated or glamorous, just just footage of traffic on a bridge. Uh, some tower blocks, again, clearly being shot at the back window of a moving car. Uh, shiny skyscrapers, again, clearly being <laughs> shot at the back window of a car. Almost certainly 10 minutes later, because uh, they're, they're driving into town quite clearly. <laughs> uh, possibly back to the hotel room so they can pack and leave. Uh, and then we see uh, boats uh, in Vancouver Bay with uh, the city in the background. And then finally, I mean, I, 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 you, you think it's something different. I mean, I, I'm, and I'm quite happy to, uh, to be, uh, to me, it looked like Tomorrow's World being, you know, it's filmed backwards or played backwards. It looks like Tomorrow World, the, the, this again, this, 70, this wonderful 70s uh, font coming back together from ball bearings. But you have another theory. Well, it, look, it, it looks to me like they're, they're, it's fluid. So I'm getting mm. sort of, um, I think it might be Mercury. That some yeah. because I think Mercury is magnetic, and I'm wondering whether it's it's loads of magnets on the table in the, in the shape of the word tomorrow's world, and there's like sort of like a, sucking the mercury onto it and and sticking yeah. sticking to it. Uh, I I wouldn't have considered mercury because obviously you know uh, we know mercury to be a dangerous substance. Ever since Jeremy Piven's horrible run in with sushi. Uh, everyone knows how dangerous mercury poisoning is. But back in the 70s, of course, they wouldn't have given a crap. They would have just thought it was fun. You know, yeah. fumes be damned. Well, so, yeah, no, I think it's perfectly possible. My, my, my dad tells me stories that they, that they used to, when they were kids, they used to go to the, I think you buy it in a chemist or something, somewhere like that. And they, they would go buy it when they were kids and play with it and, like, roll it around in their hands and stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> they, they would notice that over time, it's like, it was, it's like getting smaller. Presumably... <laughs> <laughs> he's just soaking it to their heads. Uh, <laughs> I suppose. I suppose having met your dad, I, I, I believe him. <laughs> uh, hello, Roy, if you're listening. Uh, yeah, I, I find that incredibly believable. Um, yeah, so special titles for a special episode. Yeah, yeah. It's got, it's got a nice sort of verse. I mean, the Tomorrow's World logo, it's, it's glitter and there's the old, like, silver yeah. and stuff. It's got a real sort of nice uh, disco, disco flavour to it, I think. Yeah. 
It does. It's kind of like the font they use for like Studio 54. Yeah. It's that kind of feel. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But obviously Raymond isn't in Canada at all. Ray, 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 Raymond is, yeah. is sitting outside the front of a tower block in White City. <laughs> it becomes very clear throughout this episode that they have travelled the least <laughs> distance they could possibly imagine. Uh, manage, rather, uh, from Television Centre in Shepherd's Bush. And, uh, I mean, you tracked down the specific estate because you used to work around there, but it's yeah. uh, six minutes yeah, it's, it, it, it's, away. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually it's a 20-minute walk, but it's a six-minute drive. And I imagine they probably drive. Yes. <laughs> The f- <laughs> yeah, of course they did. They didn't walk. Yeah. Um, I mean, the first giveaway for me was... I mean, initially I was thinking, like, oh, I wonder, what, could be Glasgow. Oh, could, how, how interesting. They've travelled. And then uh, later on you see some graffiti that says QPR and... Uh, yeah, but there's loads of QPR graffiti, isn't it? Like, every surface they, yeah, they point the camera at, so you have Q- yeah. QPR written on it. Yeah. In direct uh, disproportion to how successful the club are, I assume. Yeah. Uh, maybe the more, more the more graffiti we put up, the more legitimate our fandom is. No, so they haven't travelled very far, or at least most of the presenters haven't yeah, travelled it's, it's, very it's far. Only Woolard, it's only Woolard has been allowed to go over to Canada. And then they send Rod up north. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, so one of them's off to Vancouver. So let's have a listen. The conference that the politicians hoped would go away, that's how one Labour journalist has described Habitat. Canada was more than a little cool about acting as host to a potentially violent political jamboree. Vancouver City openly rejected it. But at last it's underway. More nations, more delegates, more documentation, more pressmen than ever before assembled in one place by the United Nations. Enrique Pinalosa, the Secretary General of Habitat, sees the case for a conference on the crisis in human settlements as indisputable. The world population will almost double in the next three decades. That's another world on top of this one in 30 years, and most of it in the poorer countries who are least able to cope with it. More buildings will be needed over the next three decades than have been put up in the whole of man's history. And developing countries alone will need to build for their urban populations more houses and workplaces than the developed world has built in the past 200 years. We're witnessing not just a population explosion, but the greatest migration of people in the whole of human history. That's how Barbara Ward, the British economist, describes the relentless movement of people into the margins of the cities. They go in hope of a better income and a better life, particularly for their children. Instead, they live in tents and shacks with no services, no shops, no schools, in perhaps the worst environment man has ever had to endure. But what can a big and inevitably bureaucratic conference like this possibly hope to do about it? set, as some commentators have not been slow to point out, in one of the world's most beautiful and affluent cities. I think I've come up with our first nickname, Mark. It's going to stick, William is it? William Woolard, from now on, will be known as Willy Woolly. Willy Woolly. Yes. Okay. And, when, and whenever, uh, and uh, it also reminds me of the song, do you know the song Willy Woolly Bully from the 60s? Yeah. You have to sing it today. Willy Woolly, Willy Woolly. What do you reckon? Do you think it'll stick? It'll stick for you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll give it some further consideration. William Woolard. Perhaps as a William Woolard. Mm. Um, suave. suave. So suave. Quite handsome, I think. He owns that VT. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. I was going to say I rewatched um, all the President's Men recently, mm. and he has that kind of um, uh, what's his name? Robert Redford. Robert Redford. He has a kind of a Robert Redford look to him. I think. Yes. Yeah. I, I think I, I I was thinking about this. I think the seventies is sort of a um, a heyday for for the. For the blonde leading man, the blonde blue eyed leading man, and I think uh, Willard, yes. Willard is part of that part of that trend. Um, you know, like David Soul, for example, is a Starsky and Hutch. That's another one. There's probably loads mm. more I can't think of at the moment. We don't have to. Yeah. Yes, but would you like to know some things about uh, the mighty Willard? I would. I, I really would, actually. So, born twenty third of August nineteen thirty nine. So I think that makes him our Ooh. second oldest presenter so far. Yeah. Uh, in London, he's still alive, still with us. Um, educated at State Grammar School. Very uh, good. And I went to Oxford University and then trained as a fighter pilot with the RAF. Oh. So I'm wondering whether him and Baxter... Mini Baxter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Baxter bonded over that. Yeah, so he presented to- Tomorrow's World from 1970 to 1978. Uh, I think he took over as the main presenter when Raymond left. And then after that, he became the presenter of Top Gear from 1981 to 1991. And that's what I remember him for. Uh, I, I, if I think back to Top Gear of my childhood, he's the he's the main man, like the main presenter and everything. Mm. He was, yeah, he was. I think I think Clarkson started in nineteen eighty eight, and he was like the sort of cheeky, the cheeky young scamp to William Woolard's serious, you know, serious reviewer of serious cars. 
Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously Clarkson took over when Woodard left in '91. Yeah. So then uh, after Top Gear, he, he decided to stop presenting, start his own production company. And he was the person that came up with the idea for all those ghost hunting programs. So, you know, on the Discovery Channel, there's all those... Yeah. He, 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 he started, he made a series in Britain in about 1995 called Ghost Hunters, which had this American ghost hunter in it. And then that got taken to America and just blew up. And yeah, that was, it was all his idea. Wow. He produced it. So I imagine he probably made quite a lot of money so, off of that. Um, so he went from kind of a kind of a hard, well... Entertaining but hard science program. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And immediately went out. Well, not immediately, but then he went off and he said, "Oh, I know, I know how to, <laughs> I know how to leverage some money out of my knowledge of science." Yeah, yeah. Ghost hunting. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, got to pay the bills. Mm. But he was also responsible for bringing the um, the Royal Institution Christmas lectures to the TV. That was, that was his oh, company okay. did that. Yeah. But then, now this is this is a little surprise. He is a devout Buddhist and uh, mm. keen sort of advocate of Buddhism. He's written five, four, no, four books on Buddhism, um, which you can buy on Amazon. Uh, the Reluctant Buddhist, A Personal Journey, Buddhism and the Science of Happiness, and The Case for Buddhism. And they've all got solid five-star reviews on Amazon. Oh, yeah. wow, okay. And... So he, he went from... No, I was going to say, he went from being a reluctant Buddhist to making the case for it. Yes, yeah. And... He had his own Buddhism podcast. He was a he, he, potential rival to us. Do you know? Guess, oh guess when he God. guess when he started his Buddhism podcast. Guess when he started his Buddhism podcast. Um, oh, I don't know. Twenty ten. August two thousand six. That's what, oh wow! Really yeah. early adopter. Like, oh wow! That's like incredibly early adopter of, of podcast, isn't it? Um, that's very impressive. Yeah, but they, his last episode <clears throat> was in twenty nineteen. So he kept it going for 13 years. Was like, oh, wow. Oh, bloody, like, bloody hell. Tantric podcasting, that is. I, I find it amazing there's a podcast that's done 13 years, yeah. but finished two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible. Oh, oh, that's that's that. Tantric podcasting. We, if, we, yeah. if we go over th 13 years, Mark, it'd be the year 20. Oh, of course. It'd be the year 2034. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> well, you know, I, my diary's pretty free, yeah. with, so, you know, that's a given. Yeah. We're not going to run out of episodes, so we could definitely do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, actually, just reminded me, Tantric. It's like, wow, Sting did a lot of damage for Buddhism and Tantric everything, didn't he? He did, yeah. I think, yeah, I think, I think Buddhism, Buddhism's only real image problem is that the, the number of Hollywood and, like, pop star twats that take it up, doesn't it? Yeah, has to be. Because other than that, it seems like a fairly, you know, fairly decent way of, way of going about things, but... Uh. People, you know, people seem to speak quietly but well of Buddhism, don't they? Those who practice yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it does, it does every now and then have a bit of a reputation problem. Yeah. The other brilliant thing about uh, Willy Woolly uh, is that um, <laughs> Bless the, you. On, on Top Gear, uh, actually, I'll, I'll just read, I'll read it this out verbatim from the Top Gear wiki. The top, there's a special Top Gear wiki. Um, <laughs> okay, brilliant. Um, of course there I'll is. I'll read this out. He is perhaps most fondly remembered for the pose which he'd finish each car review in. With the bonnet of the car in question lifted up, he'd rest his foot on top of the car's front bumper and turn to face the camera, an act which is known to its imitator, imitators as woolarding. <laughs> <laughs> 22 years after his departure from the show, the act of woolarding became an internet craze. <laughs> And yet, did he do that every time? I, I, I mean, yeah, sure enough. I, I mean, there's plenty of. I don't think he did it every he time. But there's plenty of photos of him with his like, <laughs> with his leg oh, jacked yeah. up on a <laughs> like Austin Montego or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually it's it's a move that kind. Is that, that's I think it's quite similar to the move that Michael Rod did in the, the first episode that we saw him in. That sort of Alan Partridgey type thing of putting your. Yeah, I'm just looking at images of it right now. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and there's the, the the internet is now littered with loads of people <laughs> copying the move, yeah. uh, and they definitely call it wallarding, not woollying. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. But that, yeah. so your nickname didn't catch on to the past. <laughs> well, no, but the, the, woolarding is what he does, but his name is Willy Woolly. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, forgive me. Yeah, Willy Woollying. Uh, well, that's incredible. <laughs> Brilliant. Twenty two years after he. Brilliant. Wow. Yeah. What a time to be alive. <laughs> so. Uh, well, I mean, let, let's talk about the segment itself, I suppose, because it, it's an introduction to to this conference in Vancouver. And um, I, I think the first half of it is actually quite informative, uh, dated. Uh, I mean, I've, you know, it's, it's talking about information from the time, but it is quite informative. It's quite well made. I think he's quite authoritative. 
I think you get you get a real sense that he does research um, and he is successfully boiling down what he's learned into quite a snappy piece. He sets out the stall or the you know the background to the conference and and, and the crisis that people feel is about to impact everyone, which basically, um, I think, you know, I was thinking about this when I was watching it first or second time. It's like, in the 60s and 70s, there seems to have been a real fear of overpopulation, mm. of the idea that the resources of the earth were limited. We'd already reached possibly saturation point, and yet projections were saying that, you know, the population is going to double in 30 years, and we need to do something about it now. And actually, t- two films popped into my head. One was Soil and Green, mm. which is exactly about this issue. And the other then was Logan's Run, which is about, you know, someone's way of dealing with it. But it, yeah, it's, it's, it seems to be a real pressing concern. Now, I did look up, because so, yeah, I think what he says, like, the conference is partly based on the population doubling in 30 years. The population in 76 was 4.13 billion. Mm. And the population now is 7.87. So actually, it hasn't even doubled yet. Quite, we're probably quite still close, on. though. Quite close. Quite, quite close. But, but also, we're more than 30 years after the conference. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, what are we, 45 years? So it's like, actually, it's taken... Am I right? Yeah, that sounds right, isn't it? 45 years after the conference, we still haven't doubled. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, that fear obviously didn't come to fruition. But also, actually, I think what we've learned over time is that, I suppose, human ingenuity kind of matches need. And the more pressing the need, the more resources are put towards it. And, you know, I'm not saying things are perfect, but they're, you, I'm not, you know, I'm not eating soil and green and chewing on my, <laughs> you know, forefathers. But there's a moment where the piece stops becoming um, kind of a news item, you know, fit for the 10. And it's the moment, to my mind, when he goes on to talk about uh, how, what the conference has to do. And he talks about how, the conference has to end the slide into urban squalor and chaos. <laughs> and he says this whilst uh, standing on an escalator, ascending into, I think, the lobby of the hotel they're staying yes, in. Yes, yeah. And then the next line is delivered while he's standing at the top and the cameraman is travelling up the escalator. And from that point off, I think the VT goes askew. And it really reminded me of, you know, because there was something about the fact that he was ascending this escalator talking about kind of urban squalor and chaos that really reminded me of Donald Trump in 2015 descending, uh, a, a, you know, a gold yeah. uh, escalator to talk about how Mexico does not send its best people. Um, uh, I suppose, you know, th- there are no originals, are there? You know, the, somebody's always been there first. <laughs> but it just, it, from that moment on, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't take it seriously anymore. But it's, it's I, 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 just, I think it's probably the hotel that the, de- that the delegation are all staying in as well because it, oh, it I think I think you're being very you know, generous. it was quite nice it looks, I, to me it looks it looks it looks impossibly opulent in a very 70s kind of way and it's got two it's got yes. two escalators in it mark I mean, that, I mean it does it does I know not <laughs> one is, two that is pure luxury yeah no I, that's 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 my um shot of the episode I think that that beautiful Ugh. up up and down the escalator Absolutely. I, 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 my description hasn't done it justice it's just it's just it comes from nowhere and um it's just fabulous to watch. <laughs> it really is. I, I, I gave it a little round of applause when I saw it again. Yeah. Beyond that, he, he then goes on to talk about, you know, I suppose the, the admin of the conference and how people are really excited about taped submissions yeah. uh, or audio visual, to use the new jargon. Yes, the new audio jargon. visually, to audio use the new visual. jargon. I know. Uh, they, they're, both, they're, pretty much, they're both Greek, ancient Greek words, aren't they? I, don't... <laughs> I, I, th- I thought so. <laughs> I thought they were Greek. They, I don't know, they might be Latin. But, you know, don't don't write in and complain. But the, you know, they are established words. Yeah. Um, oh, and also, actually, the one thing I the other thing I wanted to point out, he refers to uh, journalists as press men. Yeah, I've never heard that term before. I thought it was always thought it was, no. thought it was the press. Uh, yes, uh, but to, to me, it was the emphasis on the word men that mm. I thought was interesting, and this will not be the first or last time that you know a a collective group is described by using just one gender. Mm. Um, but yeah, just uh, just it was a really weird thing to hear. It was just a really odd, odd phrase. Quite clunky, actually, especially when you just say press or journalists yeah. or the media. Mm. No, he, he press men. That, that's that's Willy Willy cancelled. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sorry, sorry. You know, all you people who've been woolarding. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so I I did a little bit of digging to see any you know what info there was about this conference online these days. And uh, it's another one of those things that seems to have fallen down the memory hole. Uh, even like the UN's website itself 
barely addresses it. It's like le- it's less than a page on there, and there's and then it's just um, some links to the the actual documents. But there's, there's you know it's not really shouted about very much. But actually, I would have to give the best credit to a designer who lives in Vancouver called Lindsay Brown, and she's she worked there when she was a kid because they were all the local kids involved in the in the conference and um she remembers it really fondly and so she's decided to make it her life's work to you know um store all the information about it and she's writing a book about it yeah so she she was quite a good source of information on, about it the thing that i found interesting was that the the people the attendees do you, do you know the, the list of the uh, the most famous attendees oh i'd love to know yeah who so Barbara Ward, who I, I is, he gets name checked a couple of times in this. A couple of times, yeah. yeah. So I think she was quite famous at the time. I, I'm not sure I've ever, ever heard of her, but she was one of the first people to understand that I'd like bring out the concept of sustain, sustainable development, and uh, you know she's a very mm-hmm. eco- ecological person. Uh, Mother Teresa, <laughs> she turned up. Um, Margaret Mead, who was one of the people behind the '60s uh, sexual revolution. She was a cultural anthropologist. Uh, yeah. There's an Italian utopian architect called Paolo Soleri, the Canadian PM Pierre Trudeau. Is he the is he the dad of the current one or great? He is yeah. indeed, yeah. And most, I think the best one is a man called uh, Buckminster Fuller. Have you ever heard of Buckminster Fuller? Ah, I, I have indeed, yes. Or R Buckminster Fuller to give him his full name. <laughs> oh, so, going back to last <laughs> yeah, week, exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely fascinating man. You could do a whole podcast about him. Proper. Um, eccentric genius so that sort of did all sorts of things during his life like he he, he was a designer scientist architect all sorts of different things and he, and he um and he liked inventing words as well so he he invented the words dimaxion ephemeralization synergetics tensegrity and uh, he referred he referred to his own diary as the dimaxion chronophile <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what's that? I think we'd have got on with him. <laughs> and he'd have hated us, but we'd have got on with him. Yeah, uh, and he spent oh. he spent all of his time uh, uh, like going to place to place, giving talks and stuff. Then they worked out that he probably only spent sixty five days at home a year, and the other three hundred days he was out on the road, like giving talks and stuff. And because of that, he never knew what time zone he was in, so he wore three watches at all times simultaneously. So he had the time of the place he was in, the time of the place of where he was where he was going and the time of his home all on all at the same time so three watches all at the same time wow yeah should have invented himself a watch with multiple time zones on it really one but he didn't i was gonna say he's most famous for i mean we're talking about geodesic domes he's most famous for geodesic yes, domes. yes he, he so he he had this theory that every, the whole unit the, every the fundamental thing about the whole universe is that everything is held together by um basically triangles or at least shapes stuck together because he, he, he reckoned that, that even atoms and things like that, the very most basic way they can interact is if they're in little triangles with each other. So, and he thought the whole universe worked like that. And he, out of that thinking, he realised that you could design buildings on that principle. So he, he came up with the geodesic zone, which was, uh, yeah, hugely popular with um, uh, countercultural people. Oh, there's a, there isn't there a, uh, there's, a, there's a, definitely an Adam Curtis thing where we talked about geodesic domes, isn't there? And it's connected yeah, connect so, yeah. to the counterculture and, and, ecolo- and ecology yeah. and things like that. Um, definitely rings a bell. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't I don't really know why, but geodesic domes are still really associated with ecology. Like um, the, what's it called? The one in the West Country, the Eden Project. The Eden yeah. Project, yeah. Those are geodesic domes. But, um, yeah, and there's it, uh, uh, Biosphere 2, was that, was that what it was called? Mm. That mad thing in the in the states is that biosphere? Yeah, and um, no, um, yeah, it does. It does have that kind of feeling of um, <laughs> nothing to do with Buckminster Fuller, though. I suppose, but based on what you were saying, I just I, I remember being in the centre of town and walking past a Costa Coffee near Leicester Square, and there was a guy in there que- queuing up, and he was wearing a metal pyramid hat made of wires, <laughs> so you could see his head, and he was just. You know, no, it was nothing. I just going out to catch his coffee, and there he was wearing this. That I assume he was uh, wearing to allow you know the uh, the the beams in the universe to kind of focus into his mind, you know, mind's eye. Are you sure it's like not that. the reverse? He was, was, was like a tinfoil hat to prevent. Oh, these blasting things out, reading his mind. 
Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, to be fair, I had no idea what he was thinking, <laughs> so maybe it works. Habitat is nothing if not global in its scope. Not content with the Vancouver Jamboree, delegates will travel round to exhibition centres in many other countries. Here in Britain, they'll be coming to study the town planning, which William Willard mentioned. One of Britain's showplace new towns that's being discussed in Vancouver this week is Runcorn on Merseyside. And these rather familiar buses are one of the keys to Runcorn's success. Having investigated monorails, tramways, computer-controlled minicab systems, the new town fathers decided that the most realistic way of grafting their new community together was to use conventional buses running on their own totally independent busways. Today, none of Runcorn's 50,000 inhabitants is more than five minutes away from the busway, and that leads him straight into the new shopping centre. Let's talk about Raymond again, because this is my favourite bit of the show. We, uh, we were talking about Buckminster Father, so we have another one of his geodesic dome climbing frames in Shepherd's Bush, and uh, Raymond is sitting on a merry-go-round, a little child's merry-go-round. Yes, yes. He, he, he gets turned into picture, <laughs> stops... Tells us something very serious, introduces us to Runcorn, and then, <laughs> I don't know, there's a half a second of him being yeah. wheeled off, being pushed, and it is just, like, it is the exact right amount to be amusing. Yeah. Any more, and it would look like it was deliberate, yeah. but, they, but the fact they showed us something is that they pushed him off. I just, oh, brilliant. I, I was, we, can, we can stop I now. Was so, I was so close to cheering when that happened, because I would, because... Yeah. <laughs> Because when he first comes rolling, wheeling in, I thought, yeah. is he going to time his speech so that so that he sort of wheels out? He like, I assume, yeah, I assume yeah. the, the merry-go-round was going to yeah. go at a constant speed and he was going to go through frame. Yeah. But he doesn't. He actually stops. No, stops. And I thought, oh, this would, this would be good if they start here up again. And then they do. <laughs> they, they, they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure with any other... Any other presenter that would somehow just make them look silly, but I don't, I don't yeah. think it does. I think he gets away with it. I think he pulls it off. Yeah, he maintains his gravitas <laughs> throughout. And then we we cut to our our other old friend. Yes, yes, Rod. Yeah, uh, he's got he's got very, very much the poor man's William Woolard. <laughs> yeah, he, he totally lacks the gravitas of Woolard, doesn't he? Yeah, that's the curious thing. Is that um, he? He's better in this piece, which means that he got worse <laughs> over the next five years. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so Michael Rod uh, starts off, and he's talking about Runcorn, yes. which is a new town uh, just outside Liverpool, and it's a fascinating piece, isn't it? Because it's an experiment, and what I find fascinating is that the footage they film is, I think, clearly supposed to make Runcorn look beautiful and magical and wonderful and it looks horrific it looks like a really horrible place to live it looks like it has been created to corral the working class away from somewhere better i don't know like it's just it's really weird it's a really odd thing and because he's michael rod and i feel like i know him now <laughs> after two episodes or an episode and a half he's quite patronizing about the whole yeah. thing there's no way yeah. he'd ever lived there and yet he's trying to give it the big the big uh, the big sell mm. though i will say nice use of craft work Oh yeah, I, I thought that was really that really suited it. Really sort of set the set the tone. I thought that bit of yeah, because uh, craft work makes you think of the seventies and concrete, so it's perfect. Yeah, I, I have no problem with concrete in general, but this is a particularly bad example of it. And even the shopping city again, I don't know. There's just something about them that just, the whole thing just feels patronising in a partage kind of way. It's like you know that the montage of shops they all look i don't know they all look bleak though <laughs> I, you know i mean there's well, what what is in there there's, there's burton's there's uh, you know there's john menzies, <laughs> john menzies yeah i i love the idea of like a huge out of town john menzies like what i they yeah what they i have no idea uh, i don't <laughs> know every every newspaper has its own aisle. really big cans of iron brew yeah so run corn it's it's no spoiler to say that the although this is ostensibly about habitat in Vancouver, this UN conference, and we will return to it when uh, William Woolard, Willy Willy. to give him his nickname, <laughs> talks about the Fringe, the Fringe Festival. The bulk of this is about dealing with the problems of the previous generation of housing development, yes. tower blocks, basically. And what I find really interesting is that um, 
this is this whole run corn thing. I, I just because I wrote this down. Uh, he talks about how the gamble is paid off. So uh, there's these uh, houses that are made of concrete. They don't look terribly brilliant, and you know that they probably have problems that only reveal themselves, you know, ten years they look later. Like prison. They look hmm? like prison. They look like prison. Yeah, less tradition, but to the eye, at least, very successful. Yeah, it sounds like partridge, says, says, um, uh, which is a very, very partridge to thing. To the eye, at least. Um, but it's interesting. So he says the gamble's paid off, and, and it dawned on me as I was watching this. But it's that kind of early judgment, which I'm sure that the designers of the kind of estate they're in in this show, slagging off, probably said when they built it, job mm. done. We've, we've, you know what, we've created this amazing community, complete success. Yeah. We don't need to do any more. That's it, guys. You know, close down architecture <laughs> schools. We, we've perfected it. And, and yet in this program, they will explain, well, they won't explain the problems. The problems are assumed that you know they're looking for solutions to some of these problems. Yeah. Not least, not least of which is the idea of kind of creating a community, which is what Runcorn apparently is trying to do as well, which is creditable. But it's just, I just, it's really interesting that they kind of fall into the trap of going like, oh, job done, close all the architecture schools, Runcorn's been invented, just rolled it out across <laughs> across the country. And I just thought it was really interesting. Um, but that pub, Mark, would you go to that pub? Oh, would I go to that pub, Russ? Say, no, I would not go to that I, pub. I, I have to say, I think, I think flat roof pubs get a bad reputation. I know, I know there's this idea, never go to a flat roof pub, right? However, I mm -hmm. would say that my favourite pub in London is a flat roof pub. It's the um, the Globe on Morning Lane in Hackney. Just Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the, a great the pub. pub. I was just talking about it the other day. But there is, isn't there flats above that though? There's no flats above but it, I get you, but it's it is, it, roof. It's, it's, yeah, it's obviously, but it's, it's an estate it's pub, yes, it's, it's, it's part of the Trelawney estate, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. But, um, but the pub here, I mean, I think technically it's got a flat roof because it's at the bottom of a tower block, but the other yeah. thing is, it doesn't have any windows, <laughs> it doesn't it's, have just any windows a, no. it's just a it's... door in a solid wall with a pub sign across it, yeah, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Imagine how I mean, rough it is inside there, you know, about uh, 10 years after that estate's opened. If it had no door, it would be more welcoming <laughs> than, than the image that we're presented with, which looks horrifically unwelcoming. So no, Russ, I wouldn't go there because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I get social anxiety the best of times. I, I, the idea of walking into a pub that I can't even see in, uh, no, automatic judgment. I do not look like... I should be in that pub and run. <laughs> at least, at least they can't throw anybody through the windows. Though. I mean, I guess you know, Wild West style. Maybe that's why there are yeah, no maybe. windows. They're just sick and tired <laughs> of breaking the glass. <laughs> so just gonna, we're gonna throw you against a wall instead. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I, I mean, I didn't really know where to start with my research for this uh, thing. So I just, I just looked up Runcorn to start off mm -hmm. with. It's not, I mean, it's not a particularly interesting place. I would say. I, I the the first thing that hit me was that the. the uh, seven all uh, BBC three sitcom two pints of lager and a packet of crisps is set in rum corn, which, uh, which oh, doesn't wow. give it you know doesn't give it the greatest start in the world. I think that's probably no. I think it's probably the, is that the worst thing the BBC has ever done. No 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 no. <laughs> I, I mean, I, mean no, no, I, I I don't mean like no no definitely not um, because obviously two pints of lager I'm not saying it's brilliant. I just mean like no clearly there must be something worse. <laughs> There has to be. That cannot be the because that got multiple series. I got loads. It was, it was never off the TV. Which, which means that which means it. that some people yeah. like it. Yeah. What is the worst thing the BBC ever produced? Yeah. Yeah. Famous residents. Not many famous residents of Runcorn. You got. You got the. Con well, they don't live there anymore. People, I see. Well, I think people. Like, as I mean, people. People who uh, were born. But born from there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hail from. Yeah. You got big toothed comedian John Bishop, and then. Oh, do you know what? I swear to God. <laughs> the first when you said famous people from Runcorn, I thought of John Bishop. Really? Just and I and then I I told myself off in my own head for immediately just think of the first Liverpudlian it popped <laughs> into my mind. I thought, no, Mark, no, just because he's from that area does not mean he's well, from Runcorn. He is, yeah, and then he's from Runcorn. And then a uh, um, what's the word? Talent show double whammy. Uh, Kim Marsh from Hearsay. Okay. And Nicola Roberts, aka the Ginger One from Girls Aloud. Okay, both wow. from Runcorn. Those are the most interesting things I've had about Runcorn. The busway is still fully functional, still going. Oh, we didn't discuss that, did we? Which is which is a, a kind of a, I don't know um, uh, an elevated uh, road. Yes, it's entirely separate from the, um, from the cars. Like it's still it's, it, even yeah, to this day. And, and you know, lacking any uh, beauty or elan. Um, and I have no doubt dominates. 
um, the town centre. Yeah. So then I thought, well, I wonder what's happened to Shopping City. I bet it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Which looks like a low rent. Uh, again, go back to Locals Run. It looks so low rent. Go on. Well, the thing is, uh, it, in this, it's just pretty much just open. And it looks just like an old shit shopping centre already, doesn't it? And it yeah, it, it, I'm sure it's... Yeah, it does. It looks it looks uh, tired, actually. Um, but um, at the time, it was the largest enclosed shopping centre in Europe. So it's like it was a big deal. Wow. Um, that's, that's a good fact. Yeah. And... It, and it was entirely encased, and all in, the, the whole shopping centre and its ancillary buildings were entirely encased in brilliant white tiles, which were uh, chosen because they're self-cleaning. So the, the idea is that you, it, would, it would remain brilliant and white. And um, when it opened, the Times, of all places, the Times commented that sh- Shopping City is possibly the nearest planners have come to the sort of building imagined by science fiction writers. Wow. In appearance, it resembles a supersonic mosque <laughs> with, gle- <laughs> with gleaming white bricks even on the dullest day. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Supersonic mosque. As you might imagine now, Mark, uh, they've had to install loads of nets all around it to catch the white tiles as they fall off <laughs> as, as, the, <laughs> as the poor thing degrades over time. Oh, there's nothing shocking about that at all. That seems incredibly uh, believable. Yeah, so... Yeah. It, 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 so, so it's slightly falling apart. So what happened is it was actually it's actually a very successful shopping centre for the first few years, but then its owner Grosvenor they just pushed all the rents up massively. Everyone left, and it immediately fell into disrepair. <laughs> and and then it's gone it's gone bust a couple of times. It's currently it's been in administration since twenty nineteen. It is still open, but it's it's been in administration. And all oh, they're they're waiting for somebody to come up with another good idea to fix it. We slag it off because obviously it, it looks tired and stuff like that. But I have no doubt, you know, I have no doubt that they didn't advertise they were filming on the day they were filming, mm. and it was full. Yeah. And it probably was full of all the shops you'd actually need, including a giant John Menzies, because yeah. everyone needs an out of town news <laughs> agent. That's so disappointing that it was like destroyed mm. because it was because it was successful. Yeah, greed, Ross, greed. greed. Yeah. So uh, and obviously the. The centre was the set was the centre sort of the centrepiece of this Southgate estate, which is the which is the thing that he that he what did he say about it? You said it already. He says uh, less traditional to the eye at least, but very successful. So this yes. this Southgate estate, uh, guess guess <laughs> guess what happened to it, Mark? Is it no longer there? Is <laughs> yeah, quite, yeah, yeah, it's no longer there. Yeah. <laughs> it lasted. It lasted. Okay. It lasted 15 years before they demolished it because it was so awful. Do you think Rod was there chained to <laughs> the gates trying to protect this uh, this wonderful beauty? <laughs> I doubt no. it. Do you, ever, do you ever think he went back to run corn? <laughs> no, not at all. No. 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 Yeah, it was designed by James Sterling of the Sterling Prize fame. Sterling Prize? Yeah. Oh, wow. So, okay. But uh, even at the time, so, like somebody said, um, described the state as a colossal ego trip by the architect. Because it was it was it was a pure architect's fantasy with no concern for actually the people that were going to live in it, sort of thing. Which was the issue with the kind of estates they go on to talk about in disparaging terms was that it was it was planners and architects deciding how people should live, not trying to reflect how people actually do live yeah. and want to live. So it's, it's the same mistake repeated over and over again. It's like I'm going to learn the mistake from my progenitors. And uh, not repeat them, but then you make the same mistake because you have your own ego, and you just, you think you've learned everything that needs to be learned because people have made mistakes before you. It's like it's just the same crap over and over yeah, again. Yeah, and you force people to live there. Yeah, yeah. and the people who. Uh, so it, it, at least this time, you know, my, you know, Mike Rod does talk about the fact that they are trying to create a community because obviously that was the, the the key problem with somewhere like the estate in Shepherd's Bush that were you know they're filming in was that you know these places were designed, all these flats were built. But they weren't designed with shops or amenities or connections. They were these little hived off little areas, for, you know, for the working class to be put yeah. in. And there was no real sense of how people would live. And they didn't realise they, they were creating problems. You know, the politicians of the day didn't realise they were creating problems with themselves down the line. And so they, you know, well, I suppose if you pay James Sterling enough, he'll design your problems away. And I have no doubt Ron Corn was incredibly expensive. Yeah. Yeah, and it was, it was done to quite a high standard as well, apparently. But they mm. just made silly decisions. 
And I don't think you don't really see it in in the in the VT, but apparently there was lo- a lot of it was covered in like brightly coloured plastic panelling, which is something I particularly hate about uh, social housing or any sort of like big housing. So when they just bolt loads of like brightly coloured plastic to it, what is that all about? Is it like oh you know let's brighten up the place for the plebs? Let's put some brightly coloured plastic yeah. on it. Yeah, it, it always it I always looks kind of terrible. Is. It's very patronising. It, it led the locals to refer to the place as Lego Land, anyway. Um, <laughs> Which is brilliant, yeah. And then also, the, the way he designed the flats is he gave them big, round front windows... Uh, which was meant to reflect the maritime heritage of the area, but everyone just started referring to the flats as washing machines. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So most of the residents really hated the architecture, and the the way it was designed meant that criminals and vandals could really easily sort of hide what they were doing and things like that. You know, usual stuff. Um, yeah, and yeah. also it had it had this sort of central communal heating system, uh, which was oil fired. Um, which, which obviously they it's coincided perfectly with the oil crisis. So the cost of oil went up massively, oh, of course. and most of the people living in the estate couldn't afford to heat their own homes. So they didn't, they didn't heat their own homes, and then they all got lo- like loads of damp in them, and it and damp, it, it yeah. messed up with all of the, you know, caused damp problems. And there was no, there were no local shops because it was it was next to the shopping centre, but there was no like local grocery shops or anything like that. So it's like kind of the equivalent is if you like, I don't know, if you lived next to Westfield and you wanted some bog roll <laughs> and you went to like Westfield to try and buy some bog roll, probably would better find it in there sort of thing. You know, it's that, that mm. there's no amenities in that sort of way. So yeah, so they got bulldozed in 1990 only after only 15 years and then they replaced it with a load of uh, two-story semi-detached houses and everyone likes it there now. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I'm amused by the fact that your 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 go to example for a, a quick fix immediacy is bug roll. I, I think in my head I was thinking milk, but that, that's how you and I are different. <laughs> I, I I never buy. I've I, I've bought the only time I ever buy milk no. is if I'm going to make if I'm making um, bechamel. If I'm making a bechamel. <laughs> I'll buy milk. Yeah. That's the only thing I use milk for. I think. What What's the Dutch for milk? Uh, milk. Oh, got a way ahead. Milk, milk with an e. Milk. Oh, milk. <laughs> Uh, not as good, oh, not as good as point. double cream, which is of course slag room. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, slag room probably does see a lot of double cream. Okay, <laughs> right. Bring on Judith. No, no. By the way, no connection to slag room. But Rancorn is the exception. Of the fifteen thousand million pounds spent on British housing since the last war, a huge proportion has gone on buildings like these. <laughs> Now, this estate is no better nor worse than hundreds of others. There's too much rowdyism. You know, you're shut off from everybody. And once your front door is closed, you know, you don't see anybody after that. My husband doesn't like it either. We want to move out if we can, but where? <laughs> it's, I have to say, it's a sight for sore eyes to see Judith, who's a young slip of woman here. She certainly is. She's got a, she's got a fringe. Judith with a fringe. She does. With a fringe she, on top. Not her... Not her classic hairstyle. She, I mean, this is only this is only five five years before the earliest we've seen her before, but she is belongs to the seventies fully, doesn't she? So this, that no poncho yeah. type dress she's wearing and uh, and her yeah. haircut and everything. She's pure seventies. The, the the pattern on that on that dress just slapped me around the face as soon as she came on camera. I will definitely include that in one of the pictures I put on our Instagram. <laughs> yes, yeah. TW all the time. Uh, where I, I like to put up images uh, that, you know, that, that, well, some things need to be seen to be believed. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Ron Corn's going to be on there somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, so she, well, it's a bit of a Vox Pops, isn't it? Uh, she interviews local people who complain about where they live. So there's some, some real local characters, I think. Um, there are some real local you've characters. Got, you've got the gammon who hates everything. It's a, that's a real sort of oh. uh, 1970s proto gammon. You know, he's just standing there going, he hates kids, he hates noise, he hates other people, everything. Nothing to his yeah. tastes. It's not, it's, he, he didn't fight the war for this. <laughs> no. yeah. I, I don't think maybe he's suited to communal living. Maybe he should perhaps, you know, no. venture out on his he, own. He stuff. didn't say it, but just looking at him, I know he wants to take back control. <laughs> But they're they're a rum bunch, um, and it's kind of fun to see real people. Yes, yeah, yeah. They're still kind of fifties ish, aren't they? They're sort of they've got those. Th- they are those big fifties glasses. It's also yeah. I mean, like they they. It's always a reminder that you know, obviously, we associate you know uh, 
the look of decades, probably with like high fashion. And, you know, uh, the high fashion in the 70s hadn't hit this estate yeah. yet. And, but it's also a reminder, um, not a reminder, I suppose, but it's, it's interesting to me that, that these people are quite comfortable with speaking. I mean, obviously they're being asked um, something they can talk about knowledgeably, which is, you know... <laughs> how much they hate How much kids. they hate where they live. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and how much they hate kids. Um, but there is, they're, they're much more comfortable, they're much more confident on camera than, than they were 11 years Although ago. Although I don't know about you, I got the impression that the camera was quite a long way away. and It was a long way away for us, yes. It was. I felt that almost yeah. that, they were, that the camera was staying back to, to make them feel more comfortable and kind of zoom. And that's a really fair in. observation, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's true. Maybe, maybe that's the way of inducing kind of a, a sense of comfort and relaxation. At that point, they really are only just speaking to Judith Hand. Yeah. And they, they can forget they're on TV. Yeah. Well, as we all know, the high-rise boom is bust officially over. For one thing, there were enormous structural problems. Ronan Point is a dramatic example. Others, like New Malden House, are going to have to be torn down. Then there's the wind. High-rise buildings funnel the wind. That was at Euston. Some flats in Kidderminster have been declared too windy for occupation. Then there's noise, people, traffic, aeroplanes. These flats at Gateshead are empty. So, for all of you who live with that kind of problem, here is our own mini habitat. One good noise deserves another, or so the brains behind this new sound generator would like us to believe. It produces a complete range of sound waves, or white noise as it's called. It sounds rather like heavy rain. Now, the whole idea behind it is that by producing your own noise, you'll cut yourself off from those unwelcome sounds made by other people. And we cut back to Judith, who this time is in a apartment. She's in a yeah, flat. Is that, is that a real flat, flat or a set? A, 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 a slight set. Uh, I think oh. a real flat. I think, yeah, I, I, I'm not as cynical as you. Partly because I think the... <laughs> I didn't write this in the notes, but the horrific uh, house plants on the windowsill... <laughs> Uh, I think are a hundred percent real yeah. and uh, not the kind of thing you you get you know a prop shop would put in. Oh. Uh, no, I think she's in a real uh, she's in a real flat and um, she is going to talk to us about the problems with noise pollution, which obviously is a, is a problem you know that still exists. And the solution the solution to noise pollution is white noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The solution to uh, noise, Mark, is to just make a louder noise. To... Yeah. So so once again. This is another one of these episodes, uh, and there's a few of these things. I, I kind of wrote it down in my notes. There are three things in here, at least, that uh, kind of call back to previous episodes. Uh, in terms of their presentation style, uh, one was Michael Rudd being Alan Partridge. Yeah. And then there's here, where Judith Hand is once again having to talk over loud noise. <laughs> yeah. The obsession Tomorrow's World has with making sure they're... The presenters cannot be heard clear, clearly. It's specifically hand is as well, astonishing. It? It's, it's, it's specifically hand. Yeah, yeah. But here she is with a kind of you know kind of a walnut, uh, uh, kind of hi-fi speaker and this you know a box of three knobs. And her way of dealing with the noise pollution from outside is to turn up white noise. Yes, white noise. Which apparently... <laughs> yes, and speaking of white noise, she. <laughs> It's fascinating the, the the example of the use of white noise that she gives uh, in the in real world how it is a real world solution to a real world problem. She just casually talks about how it's used in brainwashing. <laughs> yeah, using higher levels. By the higher levels, yeah, the high level, high level brainwashing. You know, but, you know. Uh, so therefore, we're supposed to go like, oh, okay, so it works. <laughs> and um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so it's used for for brainwashing, which is a fascinating way of describing it. And I mean, it goes on to talk about how like. It, you know, she just well, she she refers without kind of making any kind of judgment that this is actually used as a method of torture in Northern Ireland, which let's not forget is an actual part of the United Kingdom. Mm. But it's only recently been condemned officially by the Compton Report. Yeah. Um. So that's why you should have this in your front room so you can't hear the baby next door. Yeah, because you know, if it works in the provos, it's gonna work in your estate. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about that is, that she hit me with the brainwashing bit, and without once she says the IRA Compton report bit, then it, the brainwashing bit doesn't sound as 
ridiculous. But without that, the way she just cheerfully goes, it's oh, it's, you know, it's used as and it's quite cheerful, isn't it? Isn't it? Used in brainwashing. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's why they use it as brainwashing. Yeah, <laughs> that's like a seal of approval. Oh, I've used a brainwashing. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Stop. yeah. I've got a very dirty brain. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the idea of uh, be, of having to live in a house that is where all you can hear is white noise is bonkers. It's bloody bonkers, <laughs> Russ. You know, it's like. The fact that it's used in brainwashing is celebrated as, as proof that this works. <laughs> I mean, what, what are you supposed to think? Like, the fact that... I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's, just, a re, it's just really it's, odd. Totally it's, odd. It's the constant sound... No pun intended. It's the constant sound of white noise any less maddening than just the sound of no! children playing. <laughs> no! I, I, they are not torturing members of the IRA with the sounds of children playing <laughs> <laughs> on a geodesic dome. They're, you know, it's like, no, of course it's not. It's no. utter nonsense. Wow, what, what, what a fun place to live uh, Shepherd's Bush was. But, um, yeah, so I, I, I thought, oh, white noise. I, I, what do I know about white noise? Very much, not very much. Straight into Wikipedia. Immediately discovered uh, you, could, you could, essentially, you can almost play snooker with noise mark. It turns out that there are many colours of noise. You've got, you've got white noise, which is the original. Yeah. But then yeah. there's different types of noise. You can get pink noise, brown noise, blue noise, violet noise and grey noise. Wow. And sometimes the brown noise is called red noise, depending on who you talk to. But the noise that Judith is making on her machine, having listened to it and compared it with the different colours of noise, I'm oh, yeah. pretty sure that she's playing pink noise, not white noise. Because white noise is actually far more annoying than pink noise. And pink noise is what is you. You can actually buy what are known as white noise machines. So you can, you can get these for your home. But actually, they don't produce white noise. They produce pink noise, which is a much... It's, got a bit, it's a bit deeper, a bit... Bit richer and just not as annoying. Um, a bit more sonorous. But what they use it for is, is they use, it's as a sleep aid. Because basically, with a bit of imagination, the sound of, of pink noise is very similar to uh, the sound of like waves crashing or waterfalls mm. or the wind through the trees. It's that kind of sound. So people use it as a relaxation aid. Aid and also people with tinnitus. And I've got a bit of tinnitus, but I don't have any results to this. They do it as well because it just blanks out the sound of their tinnitus, and so it doesn't put them off. So. So it's the sort of thing you could you put by your bed to help you go to sleep. But then the other thing they've they've also come into their own recently in that they can they, they can jam smart speakers. So you can buy this thing called the bracelet of silence, which you wear. So it's a new, it's a fairly new product. Only released a couple of years ago. The bracelet of silence you can wear it, and uh, even if you walk into somebody else's house and they've got like an Alexa or whatever. It won't be able to hear you because your bracelet of silence is producing sufficient white noise to drown it, drown it out. So it does. It does have. Wow. So it's kind of. It's kind of the reverse. They're using it for a similar but reverse purpose now. It's not to stop you hearing other people. It's to stop other people hearing you. That's where. That's where it's sort of its use has come in. So I thought it was quite interesting. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. All right. Let's find out how uh, how you know how else life is bleak in the seventies. Now, wind, of course, hits tower blocks at all levels, and one surprising interior problem is rain. What the designers of these windows didn't realize is that rain can be driven upwards and therefore inwards. These windows leak even when they're tightly shut, but if you open them, you stand an excellent chance of having the whole pane blown out. And of course, another very effective reason for not opening the windows is that it lets out expensive heat. It's the return of an old friend. Wind. Wind. Oh. The damaging power of wind. Who would have guessed 11 years after uh, we first heard about how wind was uh, a disruptive, destructive force? But how, my friend, how people had already thought about this and were working to counter the evil power of wind... They they didn't. It's very it, and it's still it is very much the kryptonite of tall buildings, isn't it? The wind, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah. The old old Raimondo is uh, telling us how terrible the windows are on these box of flats because the wind because the rain can just blow into the into the windows. I'd, Great windows, yeah. eh? <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether blow is that, the, into is that the, the wind's fault or is that the windows' fault? I mean, they I, they're called windows for a start. Wind. Oh, but right, so you, oh, you'd he's... think that the first thing you, when you design a window is ensure that no wind gets through it. But apparently, according to Raymond, these <laughs> ones don't even do that. No, uh, and, and earlier, um, I don't think we mentioned it, uh, but uh, there, there is footage of old women being blown out. <laughs> <in> which... <laughs> Sorry, even, even the thought of that just made me laugh. I was a, 
I, I was about to say no one should laugh at Russ, but uh, but you proved me it wrong. It is so funny, so funny, and so unexpected because it's 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 just stock footage yeah. of people battling the wind, and then suddenly it just cuts to this little old lady carrying her shopping, and she just absolutely flies backwards. Polax, <laughs> yeah, 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 totally, yeah, completely polax. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say in 1965 we learned how um, you know uh, engineers they hadn't quite quantified and scientifically analysed the power of wind. So what they were doing was they were basically kind of doubling and tripling the mass to ensure that they were, uh, you know, that their their buildings were strong enough to withstand uh, the strongest wind. And yeah, here we here we learn that um, no, it's not true at all. They've had to they've actually had to close completely constructed buildings because of the damage that wind was having. Yeah. So well done, everybody. <laughs> this new ventilation system makes it possible to use windows just for watching the world go by. Because when you want to forget life outside, it has many advantages over the open window, which lets in noise and dirt with every blast of fresh air. Inside the system, there's a fan, which you can hear when I put the pen in, which draws in the air containing that noise and dirt. But before passing it on into the room, it has a filter, and it passes it through the filter, trapping all the impurities, even tiny particles of cigarette smoke missed by most filters. And then we move on and do this to starts talking well i mean you know uh, uh, raymond um talked about how like uh, uh heat is expensive basically so how do we deal with the wind uh, but not lose heat and um, we, we cut back to judith in the flat who once again reveals how bleak the world is both inside and outside the flat she's pretending to live in yeah and how we need to block out as much as we can so that you know we can have even a moment's peace to possibly imagine a world outside outside these four walls. As far as I can, as far as and, I can uh, tell, sh- like having an open window in one of these blocks of flats is essentially the same as having an open sewage pipe. The amount of pollution <laughs> that's coming through there that you need to avoid. You mean, you're talking about the open window which lets in noise and dirt with every blast of fresh <laughs> yeah, air. that's it, yeah. Wow, what a world. Yeah. No, it does not sound great, does it? No, it doesn't, no. So her solution is to uh, get a giant Bassett's licorice all salt and attach that to the window. As far as I can tell, that appears to be it. <laughs> Yeah, why not? Yeah, that, that's that's as uh, yeah, that, that's a fair uh, ex- explanation of what we're looking at. <laughs> well, for all it is, it, it, it's a it's an air conditioning unit without the air conditioning, as far as I can tell. It is, yeah. It, it has, yeah. It's, it's the same sort of shape and proportions of a, a the kind of air conditioning unit you most commonly see in America, like basically strapped to any window in America, you've got one of these things. But she made no mention of it cooling the air, so I think in this case it's just nope. It's just a fan with a filter on it. A filter that she claims will filter out cigarette smoke, yet the size of the holes in the filter are big enough to fit my fist. Through. So I don't know. I don't know if it, it might be different fags ever smoking in the cemeteries. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I, I can't see that filter stopping much. Do you think it was like big chunky smoke yeah. fags? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, why it's, well, it's a fan with a filter on it? Is that is that what it is? I don't know. It's she seems to be implying that it's a way of kind of opening your window but not letting anything in. But I, it's uh, very uh, underwhelming. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's very sad. Um, Next, <laughs> <laughs> all that will cost money, of course. Though perhaps not quite as much as if they'd torn it all down and had to start again. But uh, wouldn't it be better if they'd managed to get the answer right in the first place, as they seem to have done in one city in Canada? Dominic Bellissimo is one of Toronto's ethnic cops. He came to Canada from Italy 19 years ago, and he's been here ever since. He's never really thought much about returning home, partly perhaps because there are now more Italians in Toronto than there are back in Venice, but mainly because he likes the lifestyle here. In six years on the beat, he's really had very little to do with crime, and that's not untypical, because this city has one of the lowest urban crime rates in the whole of North America. And yet, even in his short life here, Toronto has been transformed almost beyond recognition, from a medium-sized trading port on the northern shore of Lake Ontario to a brash, booming, cosmopolitan megacity. Have you ever seen a yellow police car, Mark? I've never seen a yellow police car, Russ, no. And it is quite an odd sight. It is, isn't it? I mean, 
I think if you're in a foreign country, you see a yellow car, you're going to think it's a cat. Or, but I imagine, I imagine this must have been a problem that they had, especially being so close to America. I was say, in North America, yeah, famously, definitely yellow famously cab. Famously had yellow cab. So uh, I can imagine yeah. that, that just the Toronto Police Department were constantly having drunk Americans trying to flag them down for a not ride all the time. What do you reckon? It, if only for shits and giggles, because I would imagine <laughs> they would assume there'd be no blowback whatsoever from... From the ethnic cops of Toronto. <laughs> yeah, who apparently don't have to deal with any crime, according to this. No, indeed. Yeah, so, yeah, so we're introduced to Dominic Bellissimo. Dominic Bellissimo, who's been there, who, who is described as an ethnic cop. Yes. Which is an odd bit of phraseology. Uh, and then uh, William Woolard. Willie Woolley. Willie Woolley to his friends. <laughs> then goes on to describe Dominic's choices. Dominic... Why he's there, why he's staying, what it is he likes about Toronto, what it is he likes about the job. All over images of Dominic driving around his yellow police very, car. Very, very slowly. And it just dawned to me, very slowly, it just dawned to me, we never hit once hear from Dominic no, himself. No, 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 he just, he just sits his car looking serious. He was clearly interviewed, and then they, I don't know, it's just, it, it, it's, only, it's only third time round to strike me as such a really odd choice. That at no point do you ever hear him. Like, wouldn't it have been much more impactful if he explained why he had stayed 19 years? I mean, obviously, you and I know he's on the run for Cosa Nostra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. And, and he, sadly, he's put his head above the parapet. But, uh, yeah, very odd. Uh, yeah, ethnic Would, would you, 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 you uh, describe an Italian as an ethnic? That's the, that's the thing, I think. I mean, they're a little bit swarthier than, than, than the Anglo-Saxon. As, uh, as I, I'm going to be honest with you, Ross. I... I wouldn't. I would describe anyone as as an ethnic, <laughs> uh, and I would probably err from describing anyone uh, based on their ethnicity. But that, w- w- what to me was fascinating was that clearly, apparently, cops be described as ethnic cops as just just a thing. I think. I, I think. I think based based on the fact that Willie Woolley goes on to describe Anglo Saxons uh, as an ethnicity uh, who have abandoned a specific area, yeah. and as you right as you rightly point out, at least he didn't say Aryans. <laughs> yeah, perhaps in his world, yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe if there's trouble in the local curry shop, send down the ethnic cop to sort out, even if he's Italian. Okay. He he speaks the language of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess there's a, a blonde hair, blue eyed man to everyone. Everyone, oh, really, 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 yeah, everyone is ethnic. Yeah, that's they? true. Really, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, it, it, sorry, here I am talking about how we never hear from Dominic Bellissimo. We actually don't hear from anyone. <laughs> no, we only hear from Willy Wally. No. Yeah, no, no, not a single Canadian voice or anybody is there? Is there? Not a single Canadian voice. Yeah, or or even a member of the British delegation or anyone or Buckminster Fuller. No, I feel like this is this is the moment, Mark, to to pull out my trump cards. Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, all right. Brilliant. I'm excited. The yellow police cars, I thought, right, have they still got yellow police cars in Toronto? So I looked it up. No, the police cars are white. So then I looked up, oh, when did they change over? And then I and then it brought up Google image search and instantly my eye was drawn to this amazing photo of a You're gonna share a, it with me. <laughs> of, well, I'm gonna show you a YouTube video actually, Mark, that you're gonna treat. <gasps> um, Brilliant. So it turns out that in the sort of <clears throat> 70s i think maybe they started a bit early but basically the, the toronto police department caught on long before disney and all these other people they caught on to the idea that a a talking car with a face would help shut would, up would shut your dirty mouth are you would, serious would help children uh learn about road safety so they, <laughs> so they built a special car they built this is an animated called blink he's called <gasps> blinky and every oh every God. every year at the procession he comes out hang on that is hideous check Russ. out the eyebrows mark check out the eyebrows it's, oh my god it's like eugene levy that is horrible did you just say it's like eugene levy that's exactly yeah, what i, I did in my notes those eyebrows no. <laughs> oh my god he has a nose i mean right so let's oh. let's level, let's let's address this this car because the design the design I... decisions on it are in, in oh my god utterly insane. So obviously the idea the idea of a of a car that has a face on it is obviously a great idea. I mean, I, I, if I look at a car now, I think it's kind of got a face normally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point yeah. of a car, the reason it's got a face is because it's got two headlights on it. Headlights are the eyes. Yes. And the grill and yep. the bumper and the, all that and the mouth and the, the face and all that. Yep. So that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've not done that with this car. They, they've, they've gone with the, no. the the same problem I have with Disney's uh, Pixar's cars. 
They do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. put the eyes in the windshield. But at least, at least with Disney's cars, they just sort of draw the eyes on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with I... this terrifying monstrosity they built here. This is horrible. <laughs> this is... This is... This is like a Cronenberg film. It, it projects a clear, I'd say, three feet forward from the windshield. And then yeah. you've got these independently operated eyes with these two thick... Eyeballs, actual yeah, eyeballs. Actual, actual yeah, blinking yeah, eyeballs yeah. with, with actual blinking eyeballs. eyes. Yeah, yeah. With presumably where he gets his yeah, yeah, blinky yeah. from. <laughs> two, yeah. No, I've not seen him blink absolutely yet. Absolutely massive Eugene Levy slug-like eyebrows. Yeah. But insanely big yeah. eyebrows. Scorsese-esque <laughs> yeah. with, with their heft and girth. <laughs> and then this kind of like this this almost crocodile-like nose that goes down to the end of the bonnet with the nostrils pointing it's... directly forward. It, yeah. I, I, I went on, when I found this, I sort of looked it up and I, went, and I found a Reddit uh, thing and things like this. I, just, I, just... I, I can only imagine how excited you were when you, when you found <laughs> yeah. this. Yeah. And you gave me a hint earlier, yeah. and yeah, I, 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 it's only a fraction of how, how jo- overjoyed you must have been. If you're listening, to, if you're listening to the audio version of this, please, please visit the uh, our YouTube version of this, or just, or just oh. type, or, or just type. I, I'll, put, I'll put it on Instagram. Type. No, no, no. I, I'll put an yeah, image put it on Instagram, Instagram as well, or, or just type yeah. Blinky 1985 into into oh. YouTube. Any of those things, you'll find it. Unbelievable. And it is. A, I can't describe what I'm looking at. Reddit was full of people saying I was terrified of this car as a kid. Like it's just it's a nightmare fuel. I still I still have nightmares about it. Oh, but it's the mouth. It's like an erectus grin. Oh no, it's not the mouth. It's not just the mouth. It's the nose, <laughs> yeah. the eyes, the face, the car, the concept, the execution. Those kids do not look happy, and they persisted. This isn't even the best bit, Mark. The best bit I've saved to a laugh. There's one article about Blinky on the, on the whole internet, and this is where I found like most of this information. It's it's from somebody called Retro Ontario. Obviously, they're, they're cataloging all this stuff. And here, here's a, <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna read this out as I as I found it. When visiting schools to discuss road safety, Blinky's modus operandi would change radically depending which grade he was talking to. So while kindergartners might be treated to Blinky singing a song or reciting a poem about pedestrian safety, eighth graders were treated to a frightening demonstration of Blinky slowly backing over a doll filled with red paint. (laughs) (laughs) Graphically illustrating the end result of what happens to children who don't probably observe their surroundings. Red Asheville. But surely that's also Blinky is not Blinky is not a car. He's a police yeah. car. Yeah. So sure he's engendering some kind of oh the idea God. of this this is he? hideous car reversing over a, a doll full of red paint. I did not expect to see <laughs> that. And well done you for keeping your powder dry when we were talking about Dominic Bell. When I was talking about Dominic Bell- Bellissimo quite seriously, and you knew this was coming. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Do we even bother carrying on talking about Toronto? That is that that is all of the research I did because the, I mean the, the the thing with that segment no is, there's not really anything in there is there it's just it's, it's literally just Willy Willy saying um, well Toronto's great everyone gets on yeah I'll make two observations what one is which the piece credits uh, a strong civic culture for one of the reasons Toronto has thrived and I I think that's being really boring I think that's really important people are invested in their in their neighbourhood. The more the people are invested in the neighbourhood, the better a neighbourhood becomes. Politicians are chosen to lead, but they need to respond to something. So that that idea of people being kind of invested, I think is really important. The other thing is, um, William Willie uh, mentions well-being in the context of talking about, like, how, you know, uh, it's really important the communities kind of engender well-being. Yeah. I personally was, re- I feel like well-being is quite contemporary. Yes, word. yeah, totally. It's, it's, it's a- and I was quite surprised. Yeah. Yeah, no, they do, and, and rightly so, because it's like well-being is not health. Because people used to talk about just health, and now they talk about health and well-being. But it's it's more than that. It's more than just well-being. Is kind of is a step beyond. It's a bit more abstract. But I, I thought it was really interesting. He just casually mentions it, it's, and he, he doesn't kind of like roll his eyes and imply that it's some kind of you know blowback from hate and Ashbury. It's like no, this this is actually what they're looking for. And then the other thing is he mentions Americans negatively twice. Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's that classic thing, isn't it? Comparing Canada to America and Canada, yeah, coming out tops. Yeah. Two more observations. Number one, it uses uh, Stevie Wonder's "Oh Living yes. to the City," "Living to the City," great, tune. which is a great tune, totally unexpected, just kicks in. And while yeah. it's doing it, it, yeah. it, it uh, I think to illustrate how what a groovy town this is, it shows a, a girl dancing 
Is, is it, am I right in assuming that this girl is her job is to dance in a shop window to sell these trousers? Yes, that was the impression. That's what I the thought. trousers have still got their label yeah. on, haven't they? And then she's just dancing. Yeah. And I thought that was just so cool. I would, I would love the. I mean, it'd be it'd probably be counted as slave labour these days, but I'd love the idea of uh, you know real people advertising clothes in shop windows. I thought that'd be quite cool. But uh, yeah, she. Yeah, I, I quite like that. And I thought a good. A good the, the, I think this is the most seventies ish. Of all of the the VT, there's there's because he's in lots of crowd shots and there's you just see loads of people wearing seventies clothes in it, which I really mm. enjoyed. I like looking at I like looking at the Re- real yeah, people wearing like real seventies clothes, yeah. Because in the seventies, every yeah. almost everybody uh, just took part in in the the mad fashions, like really gung ho. So you get some people wearing some real mad stuff. And my, and my favorite person being a a gent who sort of staggers out behind Willy Willy in the streets. Wearing a, a sort of a bright red jacket or shirt, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, with a big moustache, big hair, and he looks he looks totally lost. He looked, but he's sort of stamp, stumbling around, but completely stealing attention from the whole shot. But he looks really oh, happy. Yeah, he looks really happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. almost a little yeah. too happy. Too too happy. <laughs> yeah, too happy. Yeah, yeah. Untrust. You know. You know. You wouldn't see that kind of level of happiness in Britain. So <laughs> clearly, this is Canada. Yeah. They, they didn't fake this. Yeah. There's a less dramatic way of avoiding mass redevelopment as the Habitat delegates will discover when they visit another British exhibit, Blackburn. The problems of building a new community don't exist if you never break up the existing one. There have been houses in this, the Queen's Park area of Blackburn, since the end of the last century. And by adopting an alternative to rehousing, the local authority here are guaranteeing that this community remains intact for at least the next 30 years. Substantial grants have been made available to the householders here, most of whom are owner-occupiers, to take these solid 19th century walls and give them warmer, more convenient 20th century insides. Michael Rudd cycling around full suit, trousers <laughs> tucked into his socks, cycling around black. Well, it's a classic cycling outfit, isn't it? I mean, you know. Classic. <laughs> classic Edwardian gent in 1976. <laughs> It's no surprise that Willy Wally is in North America and Michael Rod is uh, sent to Runcorn and Blackburn. But what I found interesting about this, uh, from my perspective, my professional's perspective, is that a lot of what we see here in Blackburn is quite contemporary yes. and, and quite applicable now. So what we see basically is footage of kind of r- r- rows and rows of kind of you know, classic uh, smaller Victorian terrace houses, you know, in a classic industrial northern industrial city you know what what he shows us is them uh growing trees uh on the pavements um closing off roads to create communal um uh green space yeah. constituting the roads uh to calm traffic all of which is to engender a sense of shared ownership over kind of um communal spaces yeah. and and re-engender a sense of community in a place that you know uh, might have lost it and and there was there was nothing I saw there that I haven't seen even us here in Hackney do uh, in the local area. So I suppose it kind of made me feel a bit sad, which is that yeah. they had all this in the 70s and it clearly was lost. Yeah, yeah. Some of the, the scenes are, are really quite inspiring. They they look like lovely places to Yeah, live. totally, yeah. They look like lovely places to, to kind of share. It's, it's a, a really interesting piece, uh, though I will note, um, following on from press men earlier, Michael Rod does say each of the residents, so talking about a, a group of people engendering all genders, each of the residents has to cre- has to contribute some of his own yes, money. Yeah, yeah, uh, so amazing. just you know, casual mis- yeah. casual misogyny uh, <laughs> item number two. Yeah, but it's 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 a worthy piece, but it's it's kind of sad that that you know something that feels contemporary and um, feels new is not. And apparently we knew we knew this 40 years ago and decided to forget it or ignore it or not care enough. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the two takeaways from what I had was uh, I thought, yes, the getting people to put a little bit of their own money into it is a really good idea <coughs> because when people are invested in something, they take much more interest in it and it makes them feel like it's their their part of it and it's their own thing. I mean, they, they could have just, you, you could just turn up and do this stuff but I do. Th- I think that a way of it's probably better to get people to pay a little bit into it, so it feels like it's part of theirs. I think that's a good way of tapping into you know 
Just but, the way, the way well, this feels it. more sustainable yeah. than something like Runcorn. Yes, totally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at Runcorn, people would just put in these things that someone imposed yeah. on them. Whereas here, they're being asked to join in with something that they can, you know, be part of. I think it's a very, it's a very it creates a very different mindset in the people involved, I think, completely. Um, yeah, and the other thing, yeah, as, as you're right, the, the, I think that these ideas, like good ideas, come around quite regularly, and they're usually based on the same principles. And people go, oh, that's a great idea, never thought of that before. But they have, they've always thought of it before, it's just it never it never seems to stick. And I, mm. and I, I just, I always feel like that something comes in and prevents it from sticking. And I, I always imagine it's probably commercial interests is usually something to do with it. Yeah. Um, so it, in that sense, it was slightly disheartening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, you, you see what feels like a contemporary solution to contemporary problems. And the fact that it was 45 years ago means that something prevented it being rolled out elsewhere. Um, you know, vested interests, perhaps. I don't know. But in general, I agree with you. I, I, and what's interesting is that this, this doesn't feel like it's the state cheapening out by asking people to invest some of their own money. It feels like kind of a progressive approach to ensuring that people are invested in their own community exactly, yeah. uh, or their own or their own buildings. Now, some of it, some of it is a bit more fundamental than uh, beautification. I mean, you know, he's talking about basically adding indoor plumbing, you know, for the first time uh, ever. Lovely avocado um, indoor, which, indoor plumbing. Uh, yeah, which I, which you're 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 wonderfully obsessed with, and and rightly so because it looks <laughs> fabulous, but uh, and very contemporary, yeah. of course, avocado. Right, um, the, the, the millennials it, it, love it, it, it on their toast. <laughs> it, to me, it's a kind of a sad uh, piece because actually, it's looking towards the future, but it's 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 the kind of achievable future that really could have and should have happened. If they'd done that with all of the buildings in that state. You know, around the places, you know, we'd be living in some sort of Scandinavian paradise by now. I would have thought. Yeah, we would, wouldn't we? We'd be everything we already love about Scandinavia. But here, yeah. yeah. I thought I would oh. give you some Blackburn facts. Well, hadn't even thought about that. Go on then. So obviously, I couldn't find anything about any any of that story at all. But I decided to look at the. I went. I went on uh, Google Street View. Drove round uh, where Rod was there. All still looking very nice. Looks it still looks. You know. Still looks, yeah, yeah okay, all the houses good. all look nice and tidy yeah. and clean. So yeah. It all looks very decent, lovely. So I think, yeah, I presume that the whole thing's still, you know, going quite well. That's really good. Two other things I've learned about uh, the Queen. Interestingly, this is called the Queen's Park area of uh, Blackburn. So we've got we've got, yes. so we've got two Queen's Parks. Uh, we've got, we've got QPR. Oh, yeah, good point. Um, yeah. But number one, that this place was the uh, birthplace of Ian McShane. One of my favourite actors. Wow. Love, love Joy yeah. himself. Uh, and then yeah. the second one, which is much more science uh, connected, I thought was really interesting, uh, is that in 1948, in Queen's Park Hospital, a three-year-old girl was abducted and murdered, right? And the police, they decided to find every single male be- be- over the age of 16 who was in Blackburn on the, on the dates of the murder. And they fingerprinted every single one. They fingerprinted forty-eight thousand five hundred men. Um, wow. I don't know how. You say nineteen forty-eight. I don't know how they managed to do this. Did they, whether they sealed the, the sealed the town off or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, well, I mean, people they went, they, they went through all forty-eight thousand five hundred sets of fingerprints and found the murder murderer. Oh yeah. wow! Um, yeah. Okay. And hanged him. So you know. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. ha- a happy ending. Yeah, Brilliant. Yeah. So you know, justice was worth it in the end. But I mean, that's that's oh. that's in one in one respect, that's a very impressive undertaking. Um, and I don't, I've never heard of that the police ever doing that, you know, since. But secondly, no. that's quite a massive civil liberties thing, isn't it? Logistics. Oh yeah, true. Actually, yeah, yeah just <laughs> just just mass fingerprinting the whole town. Apparently, they destroyed the, the fingerprint records after this. They claim anyway. So um, yeah, yeah, they probably did. Yeah, uh, and that yeah that. Oh, it's very that's, impressive. That's, okay, that's yeah. Queen's Park in Blackburn, anyway. Well, well done, Blackburn. <laughs> but however appealing the idea, renovating the old can never be the complete answer. Britain's contribution to something completely different is this Cambridge Eco House. It's an autonomous house. Batteries for electricity are charged by this rather futuristic-looking windmill on top, 
and a waste digester tucked away underneath the house produces methane gas for cooking. The solar collectors along the south and west faces look after heating and up here on the roof drinking water is distilled while in the bathroom which is tucked away in the back of the house non-drinking water is recycled and the bath, toilet and cooker will all have to be purpose-built. Now this house has a completely new look. The living space may seem small for four people but the rather large garden comes indoors to be enjoyed all the year round. This building deliberately makes use of high technology. Although research money is scarce for this kind of project, a large proportion has been poured into computer simulations. The idea is that when they're completed, this house will use as little energy as possible, but still give the average person the kind of comfortable life he's come to expect. So if you don't see yourself as an alternative person, this could be the house for you. You won't have to keep a goat, for example, to boost your waste extractor, but you will have to invest a hefty sum of capital to save your running costs in the long term. Would you live in a house of the future, Mark? Yes, I would, yeah. Russ. Yes, are you offering me one? <laughs> yeah. Go, uh, <laughs> I mean, I live in a moderately futuristic house, but uh, I would like to live in an even more futuristic would house. Would you like it with a goat or sans goat? Oh, what a great, what a great question. Not one that um, didn't didn't come up when we were searching for this place. Um, I, I I'm going to go with without. I can assure you, Mark. I don't think I like in in the future, Mark. That will be your number one purchasing decision: whether you want a goat or don't want a goat with your house. That that is Judith makes it very clear. One will need a goat; the other won't need a goat. That's that is you know that should be a it, it, your purchasing it, the, decision. It, it is apparently the only difference between the two places. I know she refers to what as being high technological and the other is low oh, yeah, tech, yeah, but yeah. actually, really, it's the goat that's the difference. That is the difference between um, tech, tech, yeah. high tech and low tech, is, is, is the presence of goats. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, I was going to look it up. I thought, no, I will let Russell look <laughs> yeah, it up. Yeah, no, I have. And thank yeah, God you yeah. did. Yeah, it's all about totally. goats. It's those creepy eyes of theirs, isn't it? That's well, the difference. The only animal, only animal, animal with rectangular pupils. Ugh, I don't, I don't need it because they're quite adorable until they look at you. <laughs> um, yeah, so she's obsessed with goats, and she's, I'm just, I'm just absolutely fascinated by the idea that she's, she's obsessed with the idea of, of, of investing to save being a barrier. Now that's my phraseology, not her. She basically talks about like you have to put down a capital cost mm. so that you see savings long term. And as you and I were discussing before we were playing, it's like that's what buying a house is. <laughs> yeah. That's what buying anything yeah. is. You you don't you don't get the savings for free. You have to kind of buy the same. Yeah. You have to, of course, you have to invest. Of course, you have to buy the place. Of course, you have to lay down money to have it built. That's that's true of everything. So why this is some kind of barrier of entry? The goat thing is a barrier of entry. <laughs> the, the fact that you have to buy it is not a barrier of entry. Yes, and and also as you rightly pointed out, I knew there was a third example of somebody talking about people in general, but using a masculine term. Uh, Judith uses one right in the middle yeah. talking about like, the average man yeah no mention of women but um, this is the first segment I think in the five episodes that has talked about the house of the future but to me this feels like I mean this this could have been in any episode that we've seen so far yeah. the house of the future is always some is a, is a classic go to I think this is the first episode we've watched that doesn't have a medical Yay! segment <laughs> which i know in, in, i know previously you know we were discussed so i know it's not your favorite to fair i'm not a huge fan but i understand why they have it because obviously it's something that impacts people it, it, yeah it, it, it impacts people directly um this doesn't really have a, any medical segments because it's specifically about housing but it just feels like like after after uh medical segments surely the next most uh, regularly occurring segment is something about the house of the mm. future mm. Uh, and both of these houses actually one of them I mean there's the Cambridge house which is this pseudo TARDIS nonsense and then there is the Brunel house which actually looks like the kind of thing that you can imagine being built my assumption is that the Brunel house is just a more sustainable house built more efficiently yeah. it, it, it looked like the sort of house a Scottish farmer might live in like it, or, yeah you know, yeah exactly yeah and the Cambridge house is the kind of house <clears throat> you would see at the beginning of Grand Designs yeah. before someone got someone got uh, pregnant and uh, the roof started. Uh, someone got pregnant <laughs> and and they decided not to hire a project manager. <laughs> yeah. They were going to project manage it themselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't it does not end up looking like that. I, 
um, you know, it's it's madness. It's um, uh, the, thing, yeah. the thing with the, the thing with Cambridge House is that this is lovely model, and I'm quite interested to see where the models came from because obviously they're not at the exhibition. So were these models no. knocked up by the BBC, or did the Cambridge University have a spare model they sent them? I'm not sure. But the thing with it is, is it's it's a just a funny shaped house. It, the house is shaped like a tent, basically. Uh, yes, it is. And they yeah. just stuck a. So actually, the scale is really They're weird. You look at it and think it, it takes one or two people when you see the model originally, and then she pulls the wall down. You realise no, it's a tiny doll's house inside, yeah, yeah, yeah. and actually, it's it's like a five story tall building. It has two stories in, but like the, the sheer size of it is yeah. huge. But it, but it's ju- it's just a funny shaped building with a windmill on the top and some yeah. solar collectors on the side. Did she show, it's a glass did house. Did she show us anything else about? I mean, you could you could you could stick a windmill on top of. Any building and put some solar collectors on the side of any building. You'd be able to do it on, the, on a normal house. I didn't really understand, I didn't yeah. understand what what else about that house was. What was special about the shape? No, no, no there's nothing. No, yeah, it's it's nonsense. These I mean, these days when you watch your Kevin McLeod program, you can call it Renaissance. In, You're allowed to call it that. The program, the name of the man. <laughs> um, they would, um, you know, they'll go into the materials the building's made out of, and it's like made out of, yeah. you know, mud or. Or uh, cob, it's or, always cob, or, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, or cob, cob. That's what it is. Yeah. Leftover, leftover hemp, uh, things like yeah. that. But in this, there was, there was nothing. It was, it was purely the shape of the house and the fact it had renewable energy was really just all you needed. Yeah, um, correct. But I, I was fasc- I was personally fascinated by the wind turbine on the roof, which looked like something from science fiction. Twice in this in this program, they yes. showed wind turbines, and they're not they're mm-hmm. not windmills, are they? They're they're vertical spirals. And I've, I have seen those before, but I was wondering, I was thinking, yes. like, why are they got those... Like a, like a double helix kind of thing. Why have they got those really thing? cool you know, spirals, right, yeah. and we're stuck yeah. with really boring windmills? Do you not, do you, do you not think, do you not think we should have the spirals? The spirals are much more futuristic. Well, my assumption is that um, we have learned that the traditional windmill approach is much more efficient and much more effective and does the job better. And actually, do you know what? No, no, but what I was going to say is like, um, uh, you know, I've been to the countryside, you know, a couple of times in the last decade. I've, I've seen the countryside. And I know a lot of people out there complain about those giant windmills. I think they're amazing. Like when you see one that's like 80 metres tall and the turbines are 20 and it just rotates, it is incredible mm. engineering. Like incredible that to me is the future. So I, I do get your point. These do look like because there's a kind of a compactness to them, and because obviously they are not like um, windmills from you know the fens or something like that, or like the top of an oast house. They just seem more futuristic. But I can only assume that like they're just no good. Well, I <laughs> because otherwise you would see them I everywhere. Looked into this, Mark, you might be surprised to hear. Oh, thank God! You're you're, you're going to tell me I'm wrong. No, I'm not. No, they're called they're called they're called oh, they're, it's called the that. Darius wind turbine. That type of design. The vertical, vertical. Wow, wind. named after the guy from yes, Popeye, yeah, I yeah, assume. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Oh. It's named after a French man from uh, 1926. <laughs> he invented it in 1926. It's quite early. The reason he invented it is because it doesn't need to face the wind. The traditional windmills would have to turn to yeah. face the so wind. It, it's probably, it's probably quite a stick on top of your house. But the problem is, is that that's one other advantage, is all the gubbins in the base because it spins around the base. So you can fix yeah. it very easily. The problem is, is that it breaks all the time because uh, all of the weight is the outer edges of it because it's and so when it spins round, the centrifugal Got force you. pushes all the weight out, speeds it breaks, it. they break really yeah. easily. Whereas, yeah, uh, a, your regular windmill, all the weight is in the middle, yeah, so that's why they can't and they you can't build a big one of those. So, but you could, I think, if you had just one house, you could have a cool one because you wouldn't need to generate that much electricity, especially when you've got the goat farting in the basement. <laughs> the obsession with the goat, well, I, well, this is the other thing I looked up, I, I looked up. And I think this is really probably the highlight of the episode. Uh, goat manure. I looked up, you know, what what is the why? Why is hand so obsessed with goats? It turns out that goat manure is something of a miracle product. Like it, 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 <laughs> okay. it really, it really puts horse and cow manure in the shade. Like it, they, <clears throat> they really are second class, second class shits compared to the goat shit. Like gardeners absolutely swear by it. You, you get healthier plants, bigger crop yields. Goats not only produce neater pelletized droppings, but their manure typically doesn't attract insects or hurt plants like cow or horse manure. Goat manure is virtually odorless and is beneficial for the soil. 
is and it is higher in nitrogen potassium which are the two fertilizing elements mm-hmm. on average one ton of goat manure contains 22 pounds of nitrogen whereas uh one ton of cow manure only has a mere 10 pounds of nitrogen it really is it's like it's the stuff of the future mark if i was you wow start investing in goat manure you will not regret it wow it's the 21st century's guano it is, it is, is it? yeah it really is yeah so yeah Amazing. so once i found, once I found that out i realized you know why jude is so obsessed with goats makes total sense either that or she's a satan worshiper. I, I don't know which you know what it is yeah. well i mean that was the thing uh, yeah um okay well that makes sense I, I can only assume based on on the fact that she was expecting these punchlines to land that Everyone in 1976 knew the power of go yeah. It's just been lost to time. Yeah. yeah. Both houses would get their heating from solar collectors, but their electricity would have to come from windmills, which are more expensive and less reliable than conventional main supply. For cheaper electricity, which you can generate at home, meet the solar eyeball. It's a plastic sphere with a lens which focuses the sun's rays to a small cell of gallium arsenide right at the center. Now, because of its molecular structure, this cell can convert as much as 20% of the sun's energy directly into electricity. But the ingenious thing about this design is the method of keeping the eyeball looking towards the sun all through the day. Stanley Kubrick rears his head again, Mark. It's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's a giant... Bear eyeball. Yep, two of my favourite yeah. things. Raimondo uh, pokes Bob. with his pen. Yep, ballpoint pens and naked eyeballs. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? I, I have to say, I know we're only five episodes in, but it is fascinating how... No, it's not fascinating. It's troubling how uh, how many themes yeah. rear their ugly head every episode. I'm concerned, Russ, that Tomorrow's World secretly recycled the same <laughs> thing over and over again, and you and I are just going to go mad. <laughs> I think it's I think it's all a complex series of messages, Mark, that they're they're trying to tell us. Yeah. Yeah. Once we watch enough, once we watch <laughs> enough episodes, we'll be able to decode uh, the whole program, and it'll tell you. Oh, I I like yeah. it. Whereas I was thinking up until this episode, I was thinking like, oh, you know, this this is a, this is a real opportunity to do something no one else has done. Now I'm fearing some kind of Sisyphean task, <laughs> a punishment from the gods. But you know, one of us is going to be right. <laughs> Um, this this eyeball nonsense, I, I I don't I don't think we should be talking too much about because it it's it's utter. Well, it's it's rot. Utter, it's absolutely bonkers because even even without any you know research into uh, solar energy or anything like that. Well, I've done a little bit, but but even without it, yeah, we are well aware that solar panels already exist. They mentioned it. They've been using they've been yeah. using on spacecraft since the early sixties. Oh, true. Yeah, but I mean, Han, Han was just showing us two models that included PV panels. So, so what the hell this thing is? I have no idea. It's it's a, it's a thing the size of a <sighs> of a te- like basically a ten pin bowling ball, which is acting like a giant yeah. lens, and it's concentrating yeah. the sunlight onto a small solar panel in the back of it. Yeah. What? What? what why? Why is it? Why is it? Do? Is is it because? I guess maybe is it? Oh, because the sunlight in Britain isn't good enough. We need to concentrate it with a lens. I don't know whether that's the case. But I don't understand why you need this complex unit, this single unit, which they because most of this most of this segment is Raimondo explaining how the like the how it spins to face moves. face the light. He's much more interested in how it moves than what he does, it does. He doesn't describe yeah. how the solar panel element of it works at all. No. I think that's just assume, assume and, and it's a real Heath Robinson thing. It's it's but yeah. it, all it's all it is is about the way that you can turn to face the sun. But it <laughs> yeah. it, it would you wouldn't need to do that if you just put it on a panel and just and just that like having loads of these independently moving is not as good as having just a panel that just fa- no. faces the right direction. No, it take all the little panel, all the little whatever the sunlight is being uh, refracted on. Take those, stitch, stitch, stitch them all together into one panel. Stick it on a roof and put it on a turntable. Yeah, and and you're fine. Because, uh, because, whereas because sun, what he's proposing, the, the sun is not unpredictable. The sun moves. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's roughly the same every <laughs> yeah. day. Whereas what he's talking about is taking three hundred of these ten pin bowling ball size eyeballs and putting them in a swimming pool and every house must have a swimming pool full of 300 balls yeah it's like this this is this is nonsense this is filler 
There's no way they looked at this and like, oh yeah, this is definitely the technology. It's like utter. And the, yeah. and the, 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 the it's frustrating. The illustrative diagram he uses for that swimming pool is that they they're actually yes. the way they're drawn. They look they actually look really like eyeballs. They really do. And I just had this real image of someone just stepping outside their flat of a night to maybe have a cigarette or something. Yeah. Just turning on the exterior lights. And just suddenly this <laughs> swimming pool of three oh, 300 these... eyeballs all just swiveling around. Turning to face him. straight at you. I mean, it, it's a terrifying image. It, terrifying it's certainly in my mind. It, it, anyway. it, oh, yeah. No. Yeah. This is, uh, dare I say it, uh, and forgive me any children listening, this is bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It, it, yeah, balls by name, balls yeah. by nature. Uh, obviously, I, I, I looked it up and, yeah, don't, don't exist. There, there's, no, there's no record of them whatsoever. I've looked at... I, 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 I looked at... <laughs> through several histories of solar technology not a single mention interesting things i found out about solar panels i'll very briefly go through einstein his nobel prize was for the photoelectric effect one of his nobel prizes he got more than one didn't he but one of his nobel prizes was photoelectric effect which is the basis of all solar panels so we so we can thank yeah. einstein for this whole thing which is one thing and secondly if we covered the whole of spain in solar panels then we could power the entire world. I thought that was quite good. Yeah. Oh. Well, obviously, an area the size of Spain it doesn't have to be Spain specifically. Yeah. No. Um, but if we but if we covered the whole of the Sahara in solar panels, we would be able to power the world eighteen times over. Which I thought was quite impressive. Wow. I wonder how much energy it would make to create the panels. I don't know. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Eh? I mean, we'd have to discuss this with the Spanish. They might have. Um, they, <laughs> they might have might issues with it. But I but I get your point. <laughs> they won't mind. But anyway, yeah, so, uh, yeah, balls to that one. On to the next one. Balls to that one. So far, everything we've shown applies to those of us who live in industrial countries. But a great deal of the emphasis of Habitat is on what can be done for the developing countries. Stockholm in 1972 sported a colourful fringe of alternative groups, passionately concerned with the third world. Here in Vancouver, those fringe groups have come of age, as it were. Not only has the United Nations at last acknowledged their existence, but they're organising here a two-week talk-in on a scale that rivals the official gathering. Just across the water from downtown Vancouver, they've built their own conference centre. An army of volunteer labour using equipment borrowed from the local council and thousands of driftwood logs from the local beaches has transformed this derelict old seaplane base. Festival Fringe. Double denim, Mark. Double denim. <laughs> double denim. Sorry, is that what you're focusing on? Yeah, double Hang denim. The Canadian tuxedo. That's what I, I, was, I was trying to. I knew it's. I knew it was oh. something tuxedo. And it's just, it's yeah. just Canadian tuxedo, isn't it? And these are what because I heard. It, they've been talking about it recently because of the um, Olympic outfits, haven't yes. they? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they uh, have. Yeah, the Canadian. So, so, outfits, so yeah. Willy Woolly has gone full native in his Canadian tuxedo, yeah. a magnificent Canadian tuxedo, which I couldn't, yeah, yeah. I couldn't stop looking at with his big wide, um, wide collar as well underneath. Um, yeah, and he's he's down. He, well, he's he's grooving with the hippies, man, isn't he? He is. It, obviously, this is hippie nonsense, but um, um, he actually treats it with, with with more respect than I feared when he starts the mm. piece, and I think there is a smart recognition that frankly quite a lot of the value that would have come out of something like that conference probably was more likely to come out of the fringe yeah. than the main conference the, 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 you know the main i'm sure the main conference came with some great recommendations but the fact that it's disappeared into the internet hole and you can barely track it down says a lot whereas i would imagine there were probably quite a lot of people who went to the fringe or were inspired by people who went to that fringe uh, who've gone on to actually impact lives yeah. and deliver on some of the promise that was uh, some of the promise of the conference itself yeah i, I I've, I've always thought that it, it, it's a it's a big it's a big shame that no one takes obviously i, I understand why no one takes hippies seriously but there's a lot <laughs> of ideas that hippies have about ecology particularly they were well beho- well well ahead of the rest of the world in terms of you know concepts mm. of recycling and and all of this mm. uh, but it's, it's very hard to take them seriously because because they're, they're a bunch of hippies really because they're bunch yeah. of hippies yeah <laughs> yeah yeah because they're dirty wastrels yeah. I, I guess maybe we should blame richard nixon for this for putting us for, for, for putting it turning everybody against hippies i don't know well, here's the irony. I mean, you're not wrong to, uh, I mean, in general, uh, blaming, just saying flatly we should blame Richard Nixon is probably a great place to start. However, 
to Nixon's credit, he did create the Environmental Protection Agency. <laughs> so, you know, he, he picked up something from them, uh, uh, you know, uh, and not herpes. You know, he picked up some ideas and some concepts. Yeah, it's, uh, dare I say, with the exception of the double denim, it's actually almost a boring piece, but it's quite worthy, but in a good way. Like, it, genuinely, there's more hope coming out of what he is showing us in the fringe than there is in the conference itself, of which there are many doubts. However, I mean, as much hope as there is, it is balanced against what can I, what, what, what I can only describe as a shocking <laughs> negative view of the future, where he, he, he signs off by saying, uh, and I've, I've written this down, uh, we can think in terms of the beautiful city of the year 2000 being something like an improved shanty town <laughs> with roads and sewerage and water. Yeah. The lack of hope about the future is quite stark. Yeah, yeah. And this comes in the back of the lack of enthusiasm and hope people in Britain have about where they actually live right now. <laughs> I don't, Tomorrow's world, Russ. I don't, I, don't, I don't really understand how he envisaged how the standard of living would fall so far. I don't really understand where that I think, comes from. Well, g- going back to Soil and Green, I think the idea was that the population would outstrip the resources available. Right. And so basically you have this kind of feeding frenzy, that this, this mass kind of civic unrest as people realise that they are unable to provide for themselves and so the choices are unpalatable. Uh, no pun intended, but it comes to Soil and Green, which by all accounts is quite tasty. Um, <laughs> I th- that that to me was the fear. It's like when when you kind of look back at the the, the fear in the sixties and seventies of the overpopulation. It was that the Earth's resources were finite, and we were already pushing up against them. And and what there wasn't was perhaps an appreciation of our ability to think think away some problems. Now what we haven't done is provide an incredible housing for everyone, and what we haven't done is make sure everyone is fed to a sufficiently decent standard but we have avoided the soil and green situation yes yeah or the logan's run situation we have to kill everyone at 30 um you know we it, it's like we've we've kept our head above the water well, I, 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 but but we're we're swimming in the same place it's like that 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 you know I, I, having said that also, also like the reason i mentioned the populations earlier is because the population didn't increase nearly as fast as they thought they were mm. they imagine everyone knocking out kids like rabbits and actually the reality is maturing economies maturing first world economies maturing kind of developed world economies the you know they're no longer producing 2.4 children they're producing like 1.7 you know i know i know bill and ben um so actually you know we stopped producing children uh yeah i don't know it's 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 interesting isn't it it's like i just i suppose i just i'm just fascinated by how how genuinely negative they felt the future was and like we're talking about the year 2000 that's like he says the year 2000 which for them was what 24 years away mm. and for us is 21 years ago <laughs> as like the year 2000 was perfectly fine it was, you know yeah. it was it was it wasn't a bad year cities were more than i, I got cable I got cable television towns. for the first time in the year 2000. That was very exciting. Did you? Was it was it, it was NTL? NTL? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I remember. It was NTL because I remember. I remember in your uh, in your in your student hall, oh, yeah, no, in yeah, your my, flat, my, yeah, my, my, my house. So something I did want to mention that we've not covered. Uh, yeah, is once again cracking piece of music, but a uh, bit of Jimi Hendrix. Oh yeah, bit of Jimi. Bit of Jimi yeah. in, obviously, you you've yeah. got a bunch of hippies. You're going to have to, yeah, let's straight the Machine <laughs> Hendrix, aren't you? Yeah, you know, you've got these yeah. tippies toiling away, building the, the Habitat Forum. A bit of Hendrix. And I'm pretty sure there's a there's this bit where there's a guy lining up a camera. And then just as the camera pans across, this massive puff of smoke goes across the screen. I think probably he's smoking some sort of uh, hippie drugs. That's what that's... that's a, a doobie. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Blazing a joke. That's what I reckon, anyway. Is yeah. he? Yeah. yeah. So wacky tabacky. <laughs> yeah. Um, going back to Lindsay, what's her name? Lindsay, whatever her name is, the woman who's uh, who wrote this book about the habitat. She, oh yeah, she, yeah, yeah. Like the habitat forum was the, was her favourite bit. She 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 reckons that was the best bit of the conference, like completely. I had no doubt. Um, she said that. Oh yeah, eleven thousand people volunteers built that that uh, fringe bit. Eleven thousand. Wow, it's a lot of people, isn't it? That is a lot of people. Uh, led by a man called Al Clapp. It's a good name. Uh, it's good. Two P's? Yes, yeah, two P's, of course, yeah. So it's oh, like, of course, yeah, classic. Yeah. classic. Uh, and hang, it, was a, it, was a, it was a series of hangers. 
Hangar 7 was the most famous one. It's the social centre. And it featured what was then decreed the world's longest stand-up bar to drink at. Oh, yeah. okay. I, was, I have to say, when I, while, watching that, while watching the VT, I was getting some real strong sort of uh, festival vibes off of it. And I was, I was, I was yeah. thinking, oh, well, you, yeah. You're a real festival yeah, aficionado. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if anyone's going to spot, you know, game, game respects game. For some reason at festivals, the bar is always really high. Um, and it, it, the, there's, a, there's two, maybe three places that you go to where the counter that you ser- get served at is weirdly high. And it's festival bars, Chinese mm-hmm. takeaways, and farm and farm and <laughs> yeah. pharmacists. And I don't know what the what yeah. the connection is between those three things, but they always have really weirdly high desks that they serve you at. Who knows what that is? Hey, listeners, uh, if you've managed to make it to this point <laughs> of the podcast, well done. Uh, if you know what connects those three <laughs> things, please email tomorrow's world order time at gmail.com. Yeah, Thank you very, very much. Desperate, aren't they? Anyway. We're doing well, Russ. We're near the end. Should we watch Raven pitch a tent? Oh, I'd love to see him pitch a tent. Here's a British suggestion for prolonging that patience of the poor. It's an emergency shelter designed by a student of Bath University, Philip Hillier, for disaster areas or shanty towns. We've put it up in just one day, a roomy 12-foot square by 7-foot high dwelling. Once again, the idea is to use indigenous materials. We have built the frame of bamboo and the covering of jute, uh, not perhaps endemic to most British council estates, but what you would find in almost any tropical country in the world. I can stand upright in almost any part of the structure, which I most certainly couldn't do in a ridged tent. Now, these arched openings allow for through ventilation, and of course you can join several huts together to cater for extended families. But it's not just a temporary dwelling, it can be turned into a permanent home. The parabolic shape was chosen because it has low tensile stress, a fact apparently well known to tribesmen for centuries, and to make it permanent, you simply brush on a slurry of mud, or cement, or clay, or anything else that comes to hand, and after two or three coats of that, you have a surprisingly strong permanent structure. I mean, yeah, well, I'm not sure that was an invention. <laughs> that, that, that was, it, wasn't. it was a mud hut for people who won't yeah. already live in mud huts, based on the design of mud huts that had already been built by people who build mud huts, wasn't it? Because he, he said it, uh, he said it was, I, I he said it was a tribal bit. design, but, yeah. but it had been designed by a man in Cambridge called uh, Philip Hillier. I looked him up, no, no sign of him on the internet. So Philip Hillier had invented a, a mud hut with a para, par, parabolic root, uh, roof. So mm-hmm. that's what, something that tribal people had already invented. And this was yep. a solution for uh, the third world. Obviously, everyone's yep. not, not all the whole third world had probably come up with this idea. No. But um, it was a bit weird to claim that it was a design of a man from Cambridge when <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> it's a bit rum, isn't yeah. it? It's a bit much. Yeah. Yeah, I think they just wanted to end on on them pretending they had some kind of solution. I suppose yeah, to end on a bright note. Well, I suppose a a brightish note. I mean, I I've already highlighted the the quote that he leaves the program on. Uh, I'll repeat it: Our greatest contribution to developing countries is that we've already made the mistakes for them by everybody. <laughs> no, I suppose it is moderately bright. Though, I mean, the reference to swamp countries. I, I so the only swamp country I can think of is Florida. But that's not really a country, it's <laughs> a state. Yeah. But, no, but, it's um, not, no. I, yeah, yeah. Really that's fair, else. yeah. No, um, uh, and he, d- I just, I, I just, I, I just <laughs> while we were watching it for the third time, I did I did uh, notice something I hadn't noticed before and I highlighted to you. It's like, there's a little model, he went, um, 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 he shows these already existing constructions, but one is floating on the water and he turns it around <laughs> and they've actually placed a tiny little doll, a uh, female doll, uh, by the kitchen sink in this, um, by the kitchen in this model. There's no man in there. There's just a woman in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> they just can't help themselves, uh, can they? Yeah. Parts I enjoyed was uh, Raymond very carefully pulling, oh. pulling his cuffs back, gingerly, cuff, pulling yeah. his cuffs back as far yeah. as possible, yeah. and holding his brush of mud because he was painting painting yeah. the mud on with a brush, but he was yeah. holding it very yeah. gingerly to ensure he got no. Yeah, and not a speckle on his, <laughs> his wonderful lovely, suit. Yeah, no, lovely no. blazer and shirt. Yeah. No, he, Raymond is not mucking no, in. Not at all. Yeah, and the other thing I was interested in by was the um, 
because there's the model of the, there was a model of this floating swamp home, and then there was a secondary model of how they would all fit together. And Connect, it was unbelievably yeah. intricate. And, Incredibly and it was on screen for three seconds. And I, and I yeah. really, really hope that that wasn't just made for the programme, because if it was, that is a monumental waste of time. That's a slap in the face, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also colossally unbelievable that, that, that that's a safe way of hab- you know of living. I mean, it, it's, it, tethering, tethering floating tents together does not seem it's a, safe. It's, a, it's almost quite a like, sort of lovely, sort of romantic kind of uh, idea. The idea you'd be, you know under the stars in these little floating houses and you can that's you lovely yeah, yeah, yeah. you pay good money yeah, for that yeah, yeah. oh yeah but, but you'd live in safety yeah 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 so I, I i tried to do some research into this i've just written the words nothing to say <laughs> because the designer isn't there's not i can't find the designer and all it is is a uh tent made of mud yeah yeah that's it really um so we might as well you know so 1976 what can you tell us about 1976 1976, in two separate studies, is recorded as the best year ever in UK history. Oh, context? I mean, well, uh, we're asking because what, what do they mean by best year? I know, I know it's famously good so weather. Was, there was a study done in 20, uh, 2004, and then there's a separate study done in 2013, and they looked at quali- They looked at a variety of measures, yeah, metrics, and yeah, mat- matrices. <laughs> Yeah, but they looked, okay. they, looked, they looked at all these different things. That rather than just looking at GDP or, you know, t- they looked at a range of yeah. things and created... Uh, I, think the one, I think the one in 2013 created their own measure, which is called a GPI, which is... Hmm, I should have kept the thing. It's like gross, gross pleasure index or something like that. But anyway, it's essentially... You look at prices, you look at availability of uh, healthcare and housing and all of these things... It, and and even weather and things like that, and you put them all together and you come up with an index. And these two separate studies both said that 1976 is the best the UK has ever had. Wow, yeah. uh, which is quite interesting. I mean, haven't you seen that episode? <laughs> I I don't think anyone there is saying that. Mark, you've never been to an out of town John Menzies, have you? <laughs> and <laughs> and I'm pretty confident you never will. So no, so, no, no, I, I know, won't. No. Uh, yeah, so as a, as a general feeling, everyone's pretty, I think everyone's pretty positive and happy this year. What songs are they listening to? Uh, so the 3rd of June. 3rd of June. Uh, top 10, number 10. That Midnight Train of Georgia, Gladys Knight and the Pips. Oh, good song. Number yeah. 9. And this, right, this song, I think, has one of the greatest openings of any song into Devil Woman by Cliff Richard. The opening okay, 10 yeah. seconds of Devil Woman by Cliff Richard is perfect. Number six, Fool to Cry by the Rolling Stones. Number five, Silly Love Songs by Wings. Number four, Fernando by ABBA. <laughs> uh, num- number three, My Resistance is Low by Robin Sarstedt. Number two, Absolute Classic, Combine Harvester by the Wurzels. <laughs> Brilliant. And then number one, No Charge by J.J. Barry, which is a very strange, it's I a very strange country cool. song with a uh, sort of Tammy Winnett sounding woman in the background singing some country music while uh, this J.J. Barry character just essentially just talks over the top uh, in a country and western voice. Sort of like sort of country version of William Shatner type thing. Oh, wow. Okay. And that got to number one. It certainly did. Wow. Uh, I wonder they're yeah, so unhappy. Yeah. No, they are happy. Cinema? No, oh, sorry. So yeah, well, no, that they will look back upon the year and be happy, but they weren't at the time. Uh, at, as cinema? usual, I, I didn't actually realise until we started doing this how little cinema records were kept. So essentially, pre nineteen ninety seven, there's no official cinema box office records. Really? So what I've done is I found the top grossing movies of nineteen seventy five in America. On the, oh, on the assumption they come out in 76. <laughs> taken us six, yep. seven months, whatever, to come to Britain. Yeah. So, that seems so fair. I've got the top 10 American grossing movies of 1975. Number 10, The Apple Dumpling Gang. It's a, it's a, it's a Disney it. Western. Don't know. Oh. Number nine, Tommy. I oh, didn't okay. realise that was, so, that was such a hit. That would have been out. That, that, yeah, that would have been out in 75. No, I, that, I find that surprising. Such a hit. Sorry, that was the ninth yeah, highest. Yeah. Wow, okay. Eight, the other side of the mountain. I don't know that one. No, 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 no. Seven, funny lady. Is that, is that Barbara Streisand? That's the f- sequel to Funny Girl. Yeah. Six, three days of the Condor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Five, 
Return of the Pink Panther. Burn, burn, burn. Um, okay. Four. Dog Day Afternoon. Wow. Fourth. Yeah. God. Cinema was so much more it's mature. It's amazing it? how, like the sort of like maturity and quality of film that that gets. Yeah. Three. Shampoo. Okay. Two. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Uh, and one. Uh, really? Well, uh, yeah. Actually, now that you say that, Jaws. yeah. I wonder. I wonder if that came out in seventy-five or seventy-six in the UK. Jaws. Probably seventy-six. Jaws absolutely spanked the competition. So the third, right? So shampoo the third, the third most popular film that got forty-nine million dollars gross. Mm-hmm. Jaws got two hundred sixty million. <laughs> wow. It's insane, isn't it? That is a blockbuster. As uh, Bob Holness used to say. <laughs> uh, so if you've got to buy a house, and this is this is London, this isn't run corn prices. If you've got to buy a house, that would cost you £14,685. Okay. Which in today's money is £111,000. Okay, so cheap. Average salary, £2,500, which in today's money is £20,000. Okay. Car, £2,000, which is £15,000. Petrol, petrol is so consistent. 17 pence a litre, which is £1.28 these days. Basically the same. Yeah. Average wage, £72 a week. Pint of beer cost 32 pence. And a loaf of bread was 19p. Only half the population owned a telephone. Yeah. Only half? Wow. I probably wouldn't have bothered at the time, to be honest. I don't like telephones. Well, you live in a village, you knew everyone, didn't <laughs> yeah. you? Yeah. Okay. Best year ever. That's useful. Thanks, Russ. Yeah, that's really helpful. That helps. That, that, that kind of puts the year in context. So I, th- I, th- I think uh, I think we are ready to audit this episode, this this very special episode. Oh. Um, I, and actually, it's, it's it's a bit more complex, I think, than than previous episodes, which I think, obviously, the previous four episodes before this are, are classic Tomorrow's World. I think there's only really one or two segments. I, I think specifically the, the Eco Hair segment feels like classic yeah. Tomorrow's World in, in, in terms of structure and actually just time. The next one that seems closer would be when Judith is talking about the white noise machine and the filter. But even that... Is it? It's a bit more complex. It's it's, it's talking about a wider issue. They're kind of mini segments. So I I don't know how useful these questions are going to be, but I'm going to I'm going to ask them to you know I'm going to ask us both these questions anyway. Yeah. Which is most important invention? Which is difficult when we're talking about an episode that is well, as well, much well, about well, it's, concepts. Well, it's most important invention. Oh, you're, 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 are you going to say Blinky? Yeah. <laughs> you you fucking idiot! <laughs> of course you're saying Blinky. I looked at your face. And I said, "There's only one way he's going." <laughs> the most important invention is the one you discovered <laughs> only this week. <laughs> In fact, probably today. Yeah, clearly, Blinky up. <laughs> All right, Blink, Blink, Blinky wins. I, I wasn't thinking Blinky. I almost wonder. To me, it was like the, the most important invention is the invention of the concept of understanding that people like to live in communities. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but that's no, that you know. Also valid, Mark. But that's, that's also valid. Yeah, most worthless invention. Blinky. Can I can can I say Blinky? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we agree with that. Yeah, I, I'm actually shocked. Blinky made it through to when they redid the yeah. uh, the police cars. You'd have thought that that would have been the perfect opportunity here, like that. I love I love the idea that they go, oh guys, we 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 we've repainted all our police cars. We need a new Blinky, and they, they actually put did the Blinky first because they 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 need they need the Blinky before all other police cars. Blinky Blinky's the proof of yeah, concept. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, most inaccurate prediction of the future. I, I, this episode is so bleak and so. I mean, for me, it's probably the fact that in <laughs> in the year two thousand, the only kind of beautiful cities will be shanty towns that happen to have sewerage, <laughs> and and free running water. Uh, uh, beyond that, I mean, the predictions of the future were, were I think, mostly off. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, and uh, Raimondo's uh, solar balls. Oh, the sort of all. I suppose that certainly is. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. Def- that's definitely the most inaccurate invention. Worst screw up by a presenter. What was there a screw up by a presenter? I there was. There was one that I don't know. I, I meant to run this by you actually before we start recording. At the end of Judith Hand demonstrating, and it might be just because I couldn't hear what she was saying, but at the end of her demonstrating the two eco houses. She has what sounds like kind of a classic summing up payoff line, which has a bit of humour, where she goes, where she kind of juxtaposes the two. She goes, doesn't matter whether you're average. And then she kind of cuts to the, you know, or you're average. And I didn't get that. 
And I didn't know whether she was supposed to say something else. No, I didn't know. Because it, it's it's delivered the way in a way like it, it, it was. It's, it's, it seemed like it was a clever little joke. But no, I, I didn't, didn't get it. That. No, so maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe or that's how I screw up. In that case, I is it a commentary? I don't know. Maybe maybe it's a commentary on the people that put the houses together. Maybe maybe the people that put the Cambridge house together said that this will be like an average house of the future. And and oh, and, yeah, and, maybe. and Judith's okay. commenting. Well, no, it's not average because it's it's only for rich people. And maybe she's making a commentary in that. Yeah. Industry. But it would no, it wasn't it wasn't made clear at all. No, it it, it didn't work. It didn't make she any also, sense. She also so ruined I, her goat joke. I think I I think the goat joke works better. Oh than yes. The other way around. Yeah. Um. I, but I'm loath to say it's her. Uh, I I'm just going to assume Michael Rod did something. So <laughs> let's put it there to him. Let's say it's him tucking his trousers into oh, his actually, uh, him socks. Oh, describing that as housing estate as pleasant on the eye. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, all right. G- good yeah. shout. Yeah. Best attempt at making something boring interesting. I, I mean, arguably, <laughs> yeah, the whole episode yeah. is yeah. is making uh, a UN Habitat conference interesting. Yeah. Although, uh, you know, equally, you could argue that the Toronto Police Department are making uh, road traffic accidents interesting with Blinky. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they have made the front of that car very interesting. And <laughs> <laughs> Like, if that turned out to tell you the dangers of drugs, I would not be shocked. <laughs> uh, also, I mean, I would say the use of the the use of three quite famous pieces of pop music in this episode. Yeah. Is, uh, I, I don't remember. Yeah, pre- yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, we have heard we have heard familiar music in previous, previous episodes, but not. But not. Yes. But, well, in '96, they have um, "Shine on You, Crazy but, Diamond," yeah. don't they? But I don't. I don't think we've had like three like proper classic pieces of pop no, music no. in there, and uh, Willy Woolly's double denim. Willy Woolly's double denim, yeah. Did we say anything in the episode that made it through to the future? Well, I suppose we all still live in homes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Blinky, he's still around. <laughs> Bl- is he, Russ? Is well, he? you know... The, in, your, the, in, 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 in our nightmares. Yeah. Uh, Vancouver still yeah. exists. So there you go. So to be honest, quite a lot of it made it into the future. Mostly because they weren't really... They weren't really projecting... Uh, they, they, well, they weren't really showing his inventions, with the exception of the eyeballs and a few other things. They weren't really showing his inventions. They were, as I say, they were talking about kind of it was politics and 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 kind of concepts they were discussing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that question isn't doesn't quite work for this episode because uh, most things made it through. But a question I think that does work is what does this episode tell us about the third of June, nineteen seventy six? And I think it tells us quite a lot. I, I find it fascinating that so so a couple of studies have decided that nineteen seventy six was Britain's happiest year was that the phrase you used and yet and yet I, I i one word i would not use to describe this episode is happy this is not a happy episode mm. this isn't this is not a happy episode but i do feel like i i talk about like it there's a bleakness to a lot of these episodes but this 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 in particular has a real heavy concern about the future and that is connected to people's genuine concerns about how they're living right now yeah. And yet they're in the middle of Britain's happiest year. What the hell does that tell us <laughs> about anything? Maybe, I don't, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe just a sense of pragmatism and there's, there's no, you know, I don't, there's no sort of, oh yeah, everything will be fine in the future. No. So I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe people are just happier accepting their lot rather than, rather than, rather, which rather is no than bad thing. Towards a mysterious, wonderful future. I don't know. I mean, I mean, the people on that estate weren't happy, were they? Not, not one of them. No, they weren't. But, uh, but obviously, I would imagine anyone who is happy living there wouldn't necessarily turn up on... I mean, you, you don't know how long... Do you, I, I don't know what day it was filmed on. I'm assuming it's not going on live on a Thursday. But, like, it was probably filmed during the day. So you're, you're only really being able to interview pensioners yeah. um, who hate kids, apparently. Um, so, I mean, it might just be a self-selecting group. It might be that most people who enjoy living in that estate happily live there... Uh, but they're at work, so they're not there to tell Judith how much they enjoy it. It just, it was amusing how um, fucking miserable everyone was. <laughs> it's its an interesting, it's interesting to see one of these special episodes, because I, again, I remembered them, I, I remember watching them when I was a kid, and I think I was always a bit sad when they were a special episode. Because mm. well, all of a sudden... You know it's going to lack variety, that's the thing. Because I think... Well, that's part the thing, the... so your enjoyment of them rests on whether you enjoyed this the special yeah, yeah. topic that's part of about. the appeal is all the the variety of the program isn't it if you don't if you, if you yeah, don't like one segment you know the next thing that comes along doesn't matter it's gonna be yeah the, the next thing might yeah. be better yeah absolutely 
So maybe this doesn't tell us anything about the 3rd of June, 1976, because it is so hyper-focused. It does tell me a lot about the fashion of 1976, though. Oh, fabulous. And, and, and people's, the embrace yeah. that the wider public have of the fashion, I think, is, 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 yeah. uh, is to their credit. Totally, yeah. But I think because to wear such outlandish clothing takes a certain amount of, you know... Chutzpah. Yeah, chutzpah, indeed. And yeah. it seems like everyone had chutzpah covered out of their ears because it, everyone was there. Everyone was there. <laughs> so, I mean, that, I guess that shows a certain amount of uh, happiness in itself. Yeah, why not? I like yeah. it. All right, brilliant. Well, that's, that seems like a... F- I, think, I feel like we've ordered this episode. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Any final comments? Any other business? Any other business. Oh, uh, yeah. So, if you're listening to this on your phone or uh, whatever... Uh, please be aware that there's a video version available on YouTube. And if you're watching us on YouTube, please be aware that there is a audio version <laughs> available in all of your podcast uh, mm. apps. Yeah. All right, Russ. Well, Mark, I was, I was, was going to say, uh, <laughs> while watching that Runcorn VT, I've got such a thirst for a flat roof pub. <laughs> I've got, I got my uh, yeah. order the local mini cab, and it's just, arri- it's just oh. arrived. It's just big, it's just oh. this big yellow car. I looked out the window, oh my God. and it's, they found it's you, winking Russ. at me, Mark. It's winking at me. I think it must mean it wants me to go to the pub. So I, I, oh. I'll, I'll sign off now. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Russ. The pleasure is always. And until t- next time, I will see you tomorrow. Now, do me a favour. I, I know it's a pain in the hole. I, I feel like this one should be edited for content. <laughs>